For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, looks like we are live, and I am incredibly excited for this show. Uh, this is the second time we have had Indiana Joe Hubbard on with us. Uh, he really needs no introduction. The last uh, interview, presentation, Q&A that we had with him has gotten a ton of amazing feedback. I myself have watched it a few times because there was just so much uh, awesome information that uh, Joe was was providing all of us. So today's gonna be a lot of fun. We are refuting the critics. There's a couple specific topics we are going to touch on first. For example, limestone ordering in the fossil record. Uh, that's gonna take up the bulk of the show, but then we are going to have an audience Q&A guys. So make sure you're tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth so I don't miss them. Uh, typically we've got a ton of questions coming in. So I am going to pick out the most relevant questions, most important questions. Um, and definitely not the same questions that we answered last time. So the previous uh, discussion is in the description box. So please check that out. We've had a ton of new subscribers uh, recently in the last month. So if this is your first time seeing Joe Hubbard, please check out that previous presentation and Q&A. It was definitely one to remember. So enough for me. Gentlemen, you are on mute. We've got uh, George Bond here, my amazing co-host award-winning co-host and we've got joe here as well uh gentlemen thanks for giving us your time today joe thanks so much again it's great to be here looking forward to it should be fun yes i'm excited george good to have you well, again uh, thank you good morning uh, what award is that uh standing <laughs> uh i don't know yet but uh, like I said, you're deserving of an award. I'm not sure what the award is, but. <laughs> um, I'll forward it to Joe. I think he deserves it more than I do. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, Joe, if you wanted to give a brief introduction uh, mm -hmm. of yourself for the audience, anybody who might not be familiar with you, uh, sure. as well as the topic of the show, and then we'll kind of just jump right into it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so my name is Joseph Hubbard, uh, or Indiana Joe Hubbard, as I often go with. That was a nickname that was given to me on my first trip to Australia, uh, where we were doing some fantastic research there. Uh, so give you a little sort of brief uh, history of me and my background, very brief, because uh, like I say, we went into a lot of detail last time. And there's been some fun moments where I've uh, been sort of shown videos of critics and people uh, from our, our last uh, interview that we did together, um, calling me a fraud and uh, dealing with um, you know, my academic background and saying that I'm uh, even lying about some stuff, but uh, I don't know quite where they get the idea from. So uh, my academic background, um, my natural science degree was in geology. I majored in paleobiology. 
which is the study of fossils, but specifically looking at how those fossils, uh, in a very simple terms, it's looking at how those fossils um, lived and how the kind of environments that they were in and trying to interpret uh, past environments and things like that. So my main academic work, including the papers that have been published, uh, predominantly look at paleobiology, specifically at the using paleobiology to determine how these fossils were buried and the sedimentation and stuff like that. And we'll deal with some of that today later as we get into limestone and deposition and ordering of layers and so on and so forth. If anybody wants a detailed bio of me, um, they can go to creationresearchcenter.com and click on our team and they'll see a nice picture of my face there uh, with details of my sort of academic background. While I was working uh, for, well, sorry, while I was earning my degree, I was also working in order to pay for my degree because they're not the cheapest things in the world, especially in the UK. And so um, I was working as a zookeeper uh, while, I, uh, while I was earning my degree part-time. And uh, that actually ended up uh, leading on to do zoological qualifications as well with one of the most prestigious zookeeping institutes in the UK. So uh, a nice sort of double-sided academic background, if you like. But since uh, 2019, I've been working full-time for creation research. Um, I started working with John Kai back in 2014, and I've sort of been uh, working with him ever since, sort of uh, slowly building up the amount of time that I spend with him and the amount of research that I'm doing for creation research and speaking and stuff like that. And in 2019, I started as the director of Creation Research UK. So um, a nice sort of uh, uh, way of introducing myself and sort of dealing with this topic, because creation research, we are quite a, yes, there's a big emphasis on the research. I mean, we're called creation research. We're looking into creation. We're looking into the fossils, so on and so forth. But ultimately, um, it's not just about the research. It's also about who Jesus Christ is, which the Bible is emphatic. He is our creator, savior and sustainer. And he's our coming king again. And so the biggest part of our ministry is not necessarily the fossils or showing people the evidence for creation or as regards to uh, instead of evolution. It's actually showing them who Jesus Christ is uh, and who also who he can be, which is their Lord and Savior. So that's sort of a bit about the ministry and the work that I do. Um, what I'll do is I'll share the screen now if that's all right. And we can uh, dive into the main presentation because that'll explain a little bit more about what we're doing today or tonight Absolutely. or this morning. Um, like I say, it's, uh, it's currently getting on for half past nine here in the UK. Um, I know for George, it's fairly early in the morning and it's sort of mid-afternoon in the USA. So <laughs> we really are coming around from all over the world. Creation Research Centre, the home of our UK museums project, over 10,000 fossils and artefacts and stuff in display we have there. We're working very quickly now. It's picking up a lot more pace since we uh, spoke last time. Our museums project in the UK as we sort of come out of COVID lockdown. If you want to find out more, Creation Research Centre is the place to go. Uh, we're still working on that website, so there's still a few links there that don't work and so on and so forth, but uh, the main information is there, including about our team, so I refer you to that um, with what we're doing. Okay, another mention before we get into uh, really deep into what we're doing today, glaciers and climate, a, a fascinating topic, particularly for this year. Um, this year, the UK is holding the G7 summit as well as the um, uh, basically the, 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 the climate summit, the world climate summit uh, as well, the world leaders summit. They're both being held in the UK, one in Scotland, one in Cornwall. Uh, climate change and the whole green revolution and the green deal and uh, the UK's prime minister, Boris Johnson, is really big on this whole thing of climate change. Well, um, last year, uh, about October time last year, uh, I travelled to Iceland myself. It was quite nice to sort of get away from the COVID stuff because they're still um, uh, relatively COVID free over there when we went and actually get up to close and personal with things like glaciers, things like climate change, and actually see some of the real effects of it. I travelled there with my wife. I thought that this was a research trip. She thought that it was a honeymoon. So we had a very uh, fun and interesting time doing some fun stuff as well as some research stuff. But here's um, one of the... Um, information, tourist information boards, uh, and you can see it's talking about climate change. Specifically, their claim is that the global surface temperature has increased by uh, the average of one degree centigrade on average since pre-industrial times and considerably more in the Arctic. Mm. The Earth's climate, the sur global surface temperature is warming. And here are the claimed results. 
pictures of the same glacier uh, taking a few years apart. In 1935, you can see the glacier extends down pretty well close to where those two people are standing. By 2015, it's receded over the top of those mountains there. That's the claim. Um, it's not just in Iceland. This is also in Switzerland. You can see the same thing in 2006. You've got a nice chunk of glacier there. In 2018, that's pretty much disappeared. And the claim is this is the result of global warming, um, which is the result of these emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases due to the combustion of fossil fuels, power plants, transportation and in industry, decrease in the uptake of CO2 by deforestation and agriculture. In other words, climate change's cause is mankind. Mankind is causing climate change, causing the Earth to warm, the glaciers are melting as a result. Um, climate change is a global warming. It's also a global warning uh, that's being pushed throughout schools, media, all sorts of stuff all over the world today. Interesting topic, uh, especially when you start to delve into the history of Iceland. Uh, here's a museum in Iceland. I collected fossils from Iceland myself. Um, and you can see here what was the climate like. And it's interesting that it talks about a lot of the fossil evidence of fossil trees and fossil plants show that it's actually a fairly warm climate when these trees were growing there. Um, both macrofossil and phanological records, that's um, pollen records, suggest humid, warm, temperate conditions. The average temperature requirements for these taxa, that's the plants that were living there, uh, that became fossils from that period of the time, are up to approximately 15 degrees centigrade. Hey, Iceland used to be very warm. Now it's very cold. We know it got even colder uh, during the Ice Age, and we also know it got warmer uh, than it was during the Ice Age. It was warm and then got cold and then warmed back up again because we know when Ock Volcano became a glacier, and we also know when it melted. Oh, it became a glacier um, in around sort of the uh, 1200s. Uh, it melted in officially declared dead in 2014. In 2019, they held a great big funeral for it and set a plaque up at Ock Volcano in Iceland. We went to visit Ock Volcano. We went to see the extinct Ock Jokul Glacier and uh, take some filming and take some footage of there. And uh, all of our research has actually led us to this. What is this? This is Iceland's climate history from a biblical perspective. Oh, well, I won't tell you any more about that. If you want to find out about the significance of that graph, as well as the program uh, which we ended up making from our trip to Iceland, you can actually tune in to us on Saturday. That's tomorrow if you're in Australia listening now, or that's uh, in a couple of days' time if you're in the UK or in um, the USA. But on um, Saturday at uh, nine o'clock, uh, seven o'clock UK time at one o'clock USA Central time or five in the morning if you really feel like getting up early if you're in Australia, live on Creation Researchers YouTube and Facebook, me and John McKay will be in conversation talking about our new documentary as well as dealing with um, what is the real history of climate and what is a biblical perspective. It's very important if you're a Christian listening here and you want to have a biblical perspective on climate. Of course, if you'd like to see the new documentary, it's an hour and a half long. It's out now. We've got a brand new streaming site. And yes, it is brand new. When I spoke to you last time, this did not exist. Uh, and it's mostly what I've been busy with ever since I spoke to you last time. Um, we have a brand new streaming site from Creation Research where you can actually stream all of our productions from the last 30 years or so. You see, when John Mackay first started, John's a bit older than me, if you remember back to his interview, uh, when he first started, um, he was working with the VHS tapes. Uh, then it went to DVDs and CDs. Now even they're out, and we had our downloadable MP4s, but which are great unless you have a phone with very limited information or memory on it, um, because you can't actually download them. So now we have a brand new streaming site called Creation Research Live, where you can actually watch that documentary, Fire and Ice, exploring real history. The real history in question here is the climate, and it's the climate change in Iceland. To go to creationresearchlive.com. You can watch the trailer for Fire and Ice. You can stream the documentary as well as all of our other uh, productions as well. Okay, our theme tonight as way of introduction to what we're dealing with our questions. That they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. You see, a lot of our critics will uh, try and take what they may consider to be a purely scientific approach uh, and claim that there's no way you could ever actually get 
to creation from that, uh, or certainly to not to the Bible. We're obviously starting from a different point of view, both myself standing for truth uh, and George, um, and we make no apologies about this. We start with this statement being true, that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. Jesus Christ is the creator. And yes, I understand um, that puts us at a bias with a starting point, but we'll deal more of that issue as we go on further. Um, but this is really what our ministry creation research is all about, getting people to see and know, helping people to consider and understand together that the Lord has done this. The Lord has created it. Who is the Lord? Well, it states here quite blatantly, obviously, who the Lord is. He's the Holy One of Israel. You do realise there's only ever been one Holy One of Israel. Um, it pays to actually determine who you're talking about when you're talking about things like God, because the classic atheist example, um, I say God made the world and they say, which God? Are we talking about Thor or? Well, actually, it's a legitimate question. You need to deal which God you're actually talking about, because you realize in the beginning of the Bible, when you open it up and it says in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. The word God is not a name. The word God there, it's a very powerful word. It's Elohim. It's a plural word. So we've got an interesting little connection to the Trinity there. Um, but it's not a name. It doesn't actually define which God we are speaking about. God simply means the one at the top. God means the one that you worship. That's why you can have uh, a God of cricket, uh, as was referenced in an Indian uh, newspaper a few years back, or you can have money as your God, or you can have, you know, idols or various different things as your God. We need to actually define which God we're speaking about. The Holy One of Israel, who is Jesus Christ. This is our central theme tonight. Um, this is what we're also going to be dealing with, refuting the critics, questions and answers. And we will be re-emphasizing Jesus Christ as the creator, saviour, sustainer and coming king. Now, I actually have a list of questions here. George was wonderful enough to send me through some of the questions from last time. Um, there's about 10 questions. We're not going to get through them all. Um, here's uh, some of the topics that we uh, uh, sort of had a look at trying to cover tonight. Limestone, out of place fossils, fossil layer ordering, history of geology, fossil humans, fossil dung. I mean, it just goes on and on. And that's good. We like to have lots of uh, questions and lots of encouragement. Um, we're mostly going to deal with the first four uh, in this in this program tonight. These are questions that were asked last time. It's sort of you could probably consider it part two um, of what we were dealing with last time. It's also what the critics and the atheists have sort of uh, jumped up and down and uh, uh, and got a bit frustrated with me about. So it's uh, it's good to have questions. It's good to have criticism. So that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight. We're not going to get through all of it, um, but we're then going to throw it open to questions from the audience anyway. So that should be lots of fun. All right, let's deal with some limestone issues, limestone misnomers, uh, a claim that limestone is always marine. I was having a look back through some of the uh, YouTube, uh, the, the main YouTube interview that I did and some of the little ones that came out of that. Uh, and there seemed to be a consistent claim, um, including from this YouTube channel, Cygnus, uh, who was obviously a critic, who said that marine limestone is made of fossils. He was criticizing my claim that not all um, limestone is, uh, is actually fossils fossiliferous and not all limestone actually comes from fossils. A lot of it appears to be chemical in origin. And he said, of course, lime, marine limestone uh, has got fossils in it. Limestone is made of fossils. All right. Um, here's a very brief, certainly not comprehensive, non-fossiliferous list from uh, secular sources, from official secular sources as well, like the Geological Survey of the United States, uh, talking about uh, a Permian bright red sandstone, which is non-fossiliferous. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, again, uh, another one which goes underneath Tallahassee down in um, Florida, and a non-fossiliferous limestone. Uh, 1976, another Geological Survey paper non-fossiliferous. Okay, non-fossiliferous, again, as I mentioned down the bottom there, much of the Warshaw and St. Louis salt limestone, this is just American examples, there is a lot of non-fossiliferous limestone, uh, and you'd be amazed at the amount there actually is. Now, obviously, when we're talking about things like the uh, phosphorus limestones or the chalks or things like that, um, we're obviously talking about loads of fossils. They are indeed made up of fossils, tiny little planktonic shells uh, which make up the beds. We'll deal with more of that in a minute, but there is a surprising amount 
of non-fossiliferous limestone. So you have to ask yourself the question, where did these beds actually come from? How did these beds actually form when we're dealing with this non-fossiliferous stuff? And that's when you start to realise that there's a whole other world to limestone that we've never actually investigated properly before. And that is a chemical side of the equation, not just a simple uh, um, sub, uh, submerged or suspended particles slowly settling onto the sea floor. Here are some of our limestone investigations. We are not going to get through all of this, just as a sort of a disclaimer, um, so you don't come back at me later. We're not going to cover this all because this is, I mean, each point here could be an hour's long presentation. But we are going to look at modern limestone deposits, part one, which is modern limestone deposits which do have fossils or are composed of fossils. We're going to have a look at modern limestone deposits, part two, which are the non-fossil deposits. We're going to have a look at the geologic limestone deposit characteristics and delve a bit deeper into that when we're dealing with limestone fossils, geological limestone bed sizes, and comparing modern and geological. Um, like I say, we're not going to get through all of this, but we are going to try and get to a, a decent conclusion at the end of this nonetheless. Okay, secular limestone deposition, the standard story. Smith and Batten, I actually have this book right next to me now, it's called Fossils of the Chalk, it's a wonderful thick book uh, dealing predominantly with the UK um, and predominantly with the fossils that are found in it, hence the name Fossils of the Chalk, but it also includes a very hefty first half which deals with chalk formation, uh, published in 2002, uh, published by the Paleontological Association, very prestigious organisation here in the UK. This is what they have to say about chalk. Primary production was uniform over a wide area. Mean rates of sedimentation are very low. A deposition rate of 25 millimetres per thousand years is typical for the area. Again, a reminder to the critics and people who want to uh, actually have a go at some of the objections that we bring up to this, um, like Cygnus, for instance. Here's another quote. I think this was in reply to you, George, uh, when you were talking about the great big nautiloid or belemnite beds um, that were in there, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, all pointing in the same direction. He said one to three centimetre per thousand years deposition rate. Which orifice did you pull that figure out of, child? Um, well, uh, reminder to the critics and people who do actually want to criticize us uh, and or criticize me in particular um, first off don't use ad homs don't have a go at my academic background don't have a call me a fraud i've never uh, claimed to be anybody that i'm not you can find out all my details of my academic background uh, if you want to call it that on creationresearchcenter.com um, but really if you're attacking me for the sake of attacking me on the principle of who I am or what I've done, um, that's not really helping your argument. So first off, if you want to debate me, which you're more than welcome to, and it gives a call out to uh, any of the atheists who are watching here, and uh, Erica as well from um, Gutsig Gibbon and so on and so forth, um, if you want to debate me on the basis of evidence, then debate me. Uh, I mean, I've watched Erica's video on limestone. There's some good challenges in there. Uh, there's some really good information in there. There's some stuff which needs to be, uh, you know, fought over and debated over and discussed about great stuff. But don't attack me on the clothes that I wear or what I've done in my past. Or so. It's just a foolish argument at the end of the day. And secondly, in the case of uh, this YouTuber, um, make sure you actually know which argument uh, you're trying to deal with before you try and make what, again, and I don't want to mince my words here, foolish claims uh, about your own theory of how things were formed. Yes, it is a fairly standard belief among secular geology that things like limestone and chalk take a very, very long time to form. 25 millimetres per thousand years is very, very slow indeed. And this is in a book called The Fossils of the Chalk, so you can see some of their sort of uh, inconsistency there. The point that is, it is very, very slow according to the secular um, model of limestone deposition or the predominant secular limestone uh, deposition model. And if you go back and watch our last interview, particularly the first half where we're dealing with places like Hunt Stanton and so on and so forth, I go into a lot more detail there. But I'm not going to repeat myself tonight. Um, let's have a look at some modern limestone deposits. Um, here we're dealing with uh, modern limestone deposits and uh, where you can actually see this happening today. Now, the first place um, that you uh, sort of uh, secular scientists will point you to as a model for the production of chalk is actually calcareous 
ooze deposits. Um, a wonderful name, calcareous ooze. It's uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't know why, but I really do like that uh, that 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 name. Um, but what's interesting is this is a uh, mainly calcium. In fact, uh, calcareous means mostly calcium. So you're dealing with calcium carbonate, um, which is of course a mineral. And you're dealing predominantly calcium as well in the mineral. Uh, and you're dealing with this predominantly calcite, predominantly calcium carbonate ooze, um, which sort of is found in shallow marine uh, areas around, mostly around the tropical area of the world. Predominantly foraminifera, which are small planktonic organisms, things like coccoliths or coccolithophores and stuff like that, right? Uh, they are also predominantly very contaminated, whether that be with clay particles or rotting organic material or so on and so forth. They are also absent of macrofossils. Plenty of microfossils, uh, very decayed microfossils, uh, and very sort of broken up microfossils because this is a uh, highly um, caustic ooze which is being uh, produced here from these planktonic blooms and foraminophilia, which eventually settle down to the bottom or uh, they get pooed out by fish or so on and so forth. And it's very, very contaminated, full of clay particles, so on and so forth. Um, not at all like some of the limestone and chalk deposits that we see, like the White Cliffs of Dover, are well over 90% pure calcium. Uh, so interesting, or calcium carbonate at least. So interesting um, comparison. They're also absent of macrofossils. I mean, again, go back to our last interview, watch Hans Stanton, or even better, go on to Creation Research's YouTube channel, or go onto our new website, creationresearchlive.com, and watch the Rocks Cry Out series, uh, or watch, I recently did an interview for, um, uh, or as part of a paper that I produced for, uh, published with Answers in Genesis at their recent um, conference, uh, which talks a bit more about the limestone and the Hans Stanton and stuff in more detail. Go back and watch it, and look at some of the macro fossils we're getting out of it. Wonderful shells, great big ammonites, sometimes two feet across, huge, great big, wonderful things, um, but it remains to be seen in these calcareous ooze deposits. So there's our first um, limestone, modern limestone deposit. Let's have a look at another limestone deposit, modern by the way. Um, let's go to Harper Hill in Buxton in Derbyshire in the UK what I lovingly refer to as the Valley of Lyme. Uh, I've been here many times. I do not know the total number of times I've been here. I was actually here just the other week because we were passing there for work and I thought I'd pop in and have a look and see how it was getting on. Wonderful uh, deposit, by the way. Wonderful research for our UK department. Um, can you see the white stuff? That's limestone. It's limestone that's forming uh, in front of your very eyes. Here's our international director, John Mackay. Some of you may have uh, recognised him from our first interview that Standing for Truth did with him. Um, if not, go back and watch it. I've watched it. It's a great interview with John. And this was a few years back now, um, before I was involved with Creation Research, and he was driving along and noticed all of this white stuff. Made his driver pull over and stop got out to have a look and uh, can you see how the white stuff that limestone is sort of spilling out over the uh, top of the wall there running down the sides and uh, burying the fence posts hmm interesting get up a little bit closer and you can see how it's completely submerged some of the fence in fact like i say this was a few years back now uh, it's grown significantly since then the entire deposit has more than doubled in size. In fact, uh, from looking at it last time that I was there just a week or so ago, it's probably tripled in size since this time, or nearly tripled in size. It's got absolutely enormous, and it has some very interesting characteristics about it. First of all, this is happening very, very quickly. Um, you know this is happening very quickly in the last at least 40 years uh, because it's covering up a fence post which is 40 years old at the maximum because they have nicely prepared stakes, uh, commercially produced stakes, which have been treated in a particular way, so you can actually date them to around 60 to 40 years old. So this is 60 years old at the absolute max. It was 40 years before they were becoming really popular around farmers and so on and so forth, including the same spindled wire that you can see there. Um, yeah, 
This is about 40 to 60 years old at the maximum. And this is producing way, way, way faster than anything uh, that you can read about in the fossils of the chalk, um, that quote of a very, very slow, gradual process. But there's a big reason for this and a big reason for the difference. If you want to calculate millions of years represented in chalk deposits, you are basing it on a theory which is predominantly um, based on time. Uh, you're saying that time is the major factor in the production of chalk and limestone uh, because it takes so long to slowly build up these tiny little particles. Well, we have the same tiny little particles, uh, fossil absent, by the way. This is not made up of fossils. This is made up of uh, calcium carbonate, though, no doubt about it. You can do chemical tests on it, as we have done. This is calcium carbonate. This is limestone. But this is a chemical process. Ah, and did you notice I said process? Yeah, you see, the major factor here uh, in this deposit at Harbour Hill has got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with the process. It's about the process behind the deposition of this limestone that actually makes it happen very quickly. And that's the real factor that you need to try and get around your head. OK, there's our fence post half buried. In fact, I went, like I say, I went there a week ago. That fence post has almost entirely disappeared. The deposit has grown enormous. Um, you can kind of see on the right hand side there all of that nice green grass that's completely covered underneath uh, limestone deposit by now. Uh, it's covering up these and getting close. Can you see those layers, the wonderful layers which are burying that fence post? Oh, they're also permineralizing that fence post as well, but we'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, there's the Google image. You can find this yourself if you go to Harper Hill uh, on Google Earth or on Google Maps uh, and you sort of move it around a bit, you'll see that lovely white uh, patch up in the sort of uh, top um, right hand corner there. There it is in relation to, oh, what's this? Uh, let me just get out my nice little pointer here for you. Um, you see this? This is an industrial site. Over here is one of the branches of the universities. The big university is actually about here. You see, they're all related, and it's interesting because the locals, if you go and speak to them, it's sometimes well worth speaking to the locals because they can give you data and information which you can't actually get from anywhere else. Uh, the Valley of Lyme, there's always been a high lime concentration in the river that runs down there, but the valley only started forming uh, about 30 to 40 years ago which fits in perfectly with the fence posts, by the way, when the university and the industrial site was founded. And it was turned out that the industrial site also had a lot to do with chemical waste and bacterial and natural waste and uh, purifying it and getting it available to go into the environment. But there was a huge amount of bacterial waste which was being poured into the river system, seemingly uh, or, or supposedly perfectly normal bacteria and safe bacteria waste for a normal ecosystem. But it just so happens that we're sitting on top of a load of ah lime kiln areas where they used to mine limestone, marine limestone, uh, and actually burn it into lime kilns. And there's a lot of slag from that area. And it turns out what seems to be happening here is this biological waste is actually eating the uh, limestone and is redepositing it down in the Valley of Lime. It's a chemical reaction. It's a chemical process. Nothing to do with time in the slightest. And it produces this enormous white limestone bed, which is very rapidly filling up the valley uh, and will very soon be overtaking the road. And it'll be interesting to see what the local council has to do um, up until that point. What's also interesting is if you have a look inside of it, you can also see the beginning of some fossil formation. Our oh, fossil formation, um, secular scientists and atheists don't like me call calling these fossils because by their own definition, fossils have to be over 10,000 years old. Um, why? Well, the only answer I've ever come across is that anything older than 10,000 years can't actually fit in the Bible. But we'll be dealing with a bit of that later with the history of geology. But nonetheless, let's use some uh, scientific lingo here. Here we have a fossil which is beginning the process of permineralization. Oh, they're fine with me using permineralization, by the way. Permineralization is a nice big complicated word to mean that mineral to mean mineralization or uh, infilling with minerals through permeation. So we have a lovely branch of grass here, which is 
entrapped in the lime and the lime uh, the particles is encasing and infilling and entrapping and it permeating it with minerals specifically limestone and it's actually preserving it um, there's a leaf on the way you can still see some of the green underneath it this is just covered this isn't fossilized it's just beginning to be covered um, you can do some pH tests and you can actually work out the concentration of the lime and have a good little dig around to find some of these trapped fossils uh, you can see these wonderful hard layers that are evident all over the uh, the limestone deposit. But you also see in the center there, you've got that nice little uh, branch of old fence post sticking up. Well, I actually waded across. This is hard stuff, by the way. You can walk across this. This is pretty solid, um, a bit boggy in one or two places, but predominantly it has a hard crust on it, uh, solid mineral walk across to that middle bit, uh, do a little bit of digging and fetch out the bottom part of that stake there, that fence post. That's important for just in a moment. Um, back to the fossils, plenty of fossils falling and getting entrapped in this deposit. There's a fresh leaf which has fallen onto it. There's a half decaying leaf. If this does not get entrapped and permineralized quickly, um, it's actually going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed very quickly indeed. You actually need to bury this very quickly and deeply and without the presence of oxygen if you want to actually get it preserved. Which is exactly what's happening to this leaf here. Oh, you see the many, many layers, wonderful layers of limestone as it's flowing over. Oh, it's forming sideways, by the way, as well. Hmm, the layers are forming sideways just like we were talking about earlier when we were mocked for for believing. But it's interesting, here's a, a real life scenario of sideways deposition. And again, we're not gonna get into sideways deposition unless it comes up again in the Q&A time. So go to creationresearch.net, click on the Q&A button. There's a whole load of research and stuff on creationresearch.net uh, and check out the um, uh, Q&A site there as well. Wonderful fossil leaves like these or fully permineralized leaves. You snap these in hard, these are permineralized all the way through. They are, for all intents and purposes, fossil leaves. There's no difference between these and other permineralized leaves, only this happened very, very quickly indeed. Fossilization can happen quickly, and it has everything to do with a process. Nothing to do with time in the slightest. Um, yeah, these have been covered, some are covered, um, and are not fully permineralized or petrified yet. Uh, some are permineralized all the way through, some are petrified. Um, they are, for all intents and purposes, fossils, including that log, that fence post, which we dug up a few years back. Break it up, and you can see all the white stuff inside. It's completely solid, mineralized all the way through. This is, again, petrified wood interesting results that you get from this place and it makes one very important point it's got nothing to do with time but everything to do with the process let's grab a drink there now we're not saying that uh, harper hill is our case study uh, to explain how limestone and chalk formed all over the world that's not what we're saying at the slightest what because i mean for starters you can't actually compare the two um the same way that you shouldn't compare um, calcareous deposits with modern uh, with with geological limestone formations and stuff as well, uh, and we'll get onto that in a moment. But what we are saying is that the pr the principle here that we're trying to get across, the principle behind these um, uh, limestone formations, is this point: if you want to attribute time as the major factor for producing limestone, then you are going to get dates of hundreds of thousands, if not millions uh, of years. Um, you just simply are, because you have already decided that time is the greatest factor here, and time is the thing which actually produces something over, uh, well, given enough of it, basically. There's the same principle behind evolution. Given enough time, hydrogen, which is a colorless, odorless gas, can actually evolve into everything material and living that we see around us, including human beings. Um, that's what evolution believes. Not time, but process. You get the process right, it can happen very quickly indeed. That's the point that we're trying to make here. That's the point that we're trying to make tonight and we'll continue to make. And this point of, um, well, if you take time as your biggest factor, if you take the present being the key to the past as your biggest factor, then you're always going to come up with anti-biblical uh, answers. That's also a point which I want you to bear in mind because we're going to be coming back to that later in the presentation when we're actually dealing with the history 
of geology. Not time, but what process? Um, is it a textbook process? Because the textbook process, the one that we were talking about here, uh, our fossils of the chalk that we were talking about earlier, says that it's very, very slow, gradual and uniform. And it slowly builds up um, these chalk, little coccolithophores and little tiny planktonic uh, seashells. Does the textbook process work? Well, we're going to have, a, a, again, a look at a brief look at some geological depositions. What does the evidence show? And also trying to answer this question, should we actually take the modern limestone deposits as our framework? Um, that's the question that we're going to be asking now. Well, we're going to go back to Hunt Stanford for this, and this is going to be a very brief part of the presentation because we've dealt a lot with uh, macro fossils. We've dealt a lot with the big fossil evidence in our last interview with Standing for Truth. So go back and watch some of that. The presentation in particular um, still stands up. Hunt Stanton, wonderful place. Uh, lots of great big fossils. In fact, fossils that have been squashed together. Uh, you can see our shark tooth there, which is squashed into our ammonite. Uh, you can see our vertical sea urchin, um, which is sort of uh, squished up against the side of that ammonite there as well. And uh, it's also a living fossil. We made that point last time, didn't we? This is a living fossil, no change at all in a supposed 99 million years. They're still exactly the same. Wonderful evidence, wonderful fossils. Remember the point that we made last time, or go back and watch it if you weren't there. 93% of fossils in our research uh, actually show transportation. Therefore, you can easily conclude that these fossils were formed in water flowing in one direction, being caught up in a slurry of sediment before being rapidly buried and fossilized. And this was something in particular that uh, Erica and uh, some of the other critics complained about uh, because they claimed that there have been no papers showing this. They've claimed that there's been no evidence showing this in the slightest um, and certainly nothing that's been peer reviewed. Well, let's have a little bit of a look into that as well. Uh, but before we do that, let's have a look at some other limestone examples. Let's move away from uh, Hannah Stanton and take you to another research area of mine, um, the Whitby limestone. Whitby is a very famous place in the Yorkshire coast. Um, it's where Captain James Cook uh, grew up and was born. And obviously, um, uh, George, you know, know about Captain James Cook of uh, the, the sort of uh, Westerner who discovered that Australia existed and claimed it as part of the British Empire. Uh, and you can go into the politics of that if you wish. But uh, Whitby's a very famous place in the UK and it's got some wonderful fossils there. Um, it's part of the Jurassic fossils. It's part of the Jurassic sediments, which are found not only down on the famous Jurassic coast on the south of the UK, but they run all the way up through the UK, cutting up through Norfolk and arrive uh, up at the top of Yorkshire and carry on into Scotland as well. And you get some wonderful fossils like this. You see the little uh, bullet-shaped elongated fossils there, the bellum knights. This was a specimen that we found, um, it wasn't last year, it was the year before, uh, on a research trip there that I was doing for a paper that I was writing for university uh, on the bellum knights there. I don't know how they actually were fossilised. And it's a very interesting uh, uh, looking uh, fossil, but you can see all the bellum knights, the elongated things there, all pointing in more or less the same direction. One or two that have been caught up and spun round, as you can see where they've been pushed out, but generally speaking, they're pointing in the same direction. Transported and oriented fossils. Again, um, Cygnus, this YouTube critic who's commented a lot on our limestone and stuff, uh, when I was talking about elongated fossils, and George was also talking about elongated fossils pointing in the same direction, uh, saying he, that's me, uh, is simply incorrect. Fossils pointing in the same way indicated car waters. Okay, I was actually mentioned this point to um, our director, John Mackay, uh, this evening, actually, we were talking about it, and our recommendation in the nicest way possible uh, to Cygnus is to fill up a bathtub of water and play around with sticks and flow. Um, that's basically what scientists do study flow and currents and stuff do on a, on a big scale and with much more expensive equipment than a bathtub. Um, but what's interesting, uh, I have another book here um, called Geological Field Techniques. It's a very well-known book in the UK, at least. Uh, published by Wiley Blackwell, which is a very prestigious scientific publisher. Um, I was uh, administered this book, if you like, when I was studying geology and going through university. Uh, it's a fascinating book. It deals with a lot of the, the practical side of geology. It's well known amongst many other universities. This is what um, this says. 
Co et al. 2016. This is a secular book, by the way. Um, I'm just saying this to sort of get the point across that this is a well-established principle in geology. Um, fossil orientation data is important when determining sedimentary deposition. In flowing fluids and currents, Body fossils may become oriented in relation to that flow. This is most commonly seen in elongate remains such as trees and belemnites, indicating deposition under flow. In other words, if you find elongated fossils like belemnites, like we were just using, um, whoops, back there, belemnites, elongated belemnites pointing in roughly the same direction, or in the case of the um, uh, nautiloids, uh, that George was talking about, the orthoceras found in Morocco and also in the Red Wall limestone in the Grand Canyon and so on and so forth, um, or even in the trees, if you come to Jurassic Arc, I'm not sure if we mentioned that in the last interview or not, but if you come to Jurassic Arc, uh, our outdoor Australian creation museum, you find an enormous abundance of trees all pointing in the same direction. It's a fossil flood log jam, no doubt about it. And this covers most of Australia. Fossil orientation data is important when you have fossils all oriented in more or less the same way. From our um, experiments and sort of uh, field data, we tend to find that um, three out of, well, sorry, the other way around, one out of four fossils tend to be not oriented in that way, so pointing the other way or where they've got caught up or twisted around or whatever. But if the majority uh, of your fossils are pointing in the same way, this is indicating deposition under flow. This is a well-known, well-established principle in geology. It was taught all throughout my university, taught throughout universities all over the world. What they don't seem to do is put two and two together. Um, they very rarely say, well, we've recognised this here. Now let's actually match that up elsewhere around the world. Um, like, for instance, well, we clearly have flood deposited stuff here in Australia, at Jurassic Arc, but in fact, this deposit goes over most of Australia or the Jurassic sediment with all the belemnites pointing in the same way covers most of the UK and goes over into um, uh, Germany and Europe and down into Africa and across in Asia. It covers a huge uh, volume of space. But it is a, a very important principle and one that's well established in geology. Um, transported and oriented fossils show deposition under flow, show current direction. The principal point, many large limestone deposits uh, show evidence of rapid and turbulent deposition. Modern ooze deposits don't. OK, but what about the scientific literature and where did this idea of slow deposition actually come from? That's where we're going on to now. Um, a few papers that I've written and published with the university, um, these are all peer reviewed or peer marked or um, tutor or professor marked. Um, the evidence of transportation and rapid burial in the fossils of Hunstanton. That was my first paper. I reported a bit on that last time. You can find this paper online as well. Um, so go and check that out published that in 2017. That was an accredited piece of work by myself. Uh, Bell of Knights of Whitby, Evidence of Transportation, a more recent one in 2018. Again, using that example, this was all accredited. This is all marked work. This has been published. You can find these. Um, evidence of transportation uh, showing great evidence that this limestone, chalk in the case of Unstanton, Whitby limestone in the case of the Bell of Knights of Whitby, all formed under flow all formed rapidly with currents pointing these creatures in the same direction. Other scientific literature, in case some critics don't uh, uh, take uh, me as uh, uh, academically credible, which is up to you, um, but like I say, these have all been published academically. But this is a nice, interesting paper. There's a few different papers that you can come across with this. Uh, so the claim that uh, Erica makes that there aren't any scientific papers like this is actually false. And here I am providing evidence that it is false. Uh, this was one that actually George passed on to me. So thank you for that, George. Um, Interesting uh, little comment here, published in 2013, Journal of Sedimentary Research. I know the journal well. It's a fairly prestigious research journal. The observations we report suggest that published interpretations of ancient lime muds and derived paleo-oceanographic conditions may need to be re-evaluated. In other words, what he's saying is we need to have a rethink about the way that limestone actually forms. Observations, he continues, from modern carbonate environments and from the rock record suggest that deposition of carbonate muds by currents could have been common throughout the geological history. Um, carbonates can occur. Uh, limestones can be formed through current for lead deposition. Hmm. Uh, and finally, this is the comment which I found most interesting. Uh, he says here, similarly, 
Conventional wisdom about low energy requirements for shale deposition discouraged geologists from entertaining high energy alternatives for many years. It is therefore quite possible that more carbonate muds will be interpreted as high energy deposits once the science behind the concept becomes established. Um, it seems like they're actually catching up with what creationists have been saying for a long time. Interesting point from a secular scientific journal. Remember, his point that he's making here in this journal as well uh, is the one that I've been making over and over again. It's got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with the process. Not time, but process. Hey, we made that comment last time over and over again, but it's something that has been so drilled into people from day one uh, to be the opposite that it sometimes is worth repeating it over and over to try and get you to see over and over again we're providing evidence that the primary principle behind the limestone, and uh, actually it's not just limestone, it's all geology, all fossilization, and even living things, the principle behind it has got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with a process. Did you catch it? That final comment. Similarly, conventional wisdom about low energy requirements for shale deposition discouraged geologists from entertaining high energy alternatives. Conventional wisdom discouraged, discouraged geologists from uh, investigating, if you like, or entertaining high energy alternatives. Put that in uh, simple language. Um, conventional wisdom, uh, secular science has predominantly discouraged geologists from looking at the evidence of a flood. That's why they're saying here um, that this has never been looked at before. It's therefore quite possible, he says, that carbonate muds will be interpreted as high energy deposits once the science behind this concept becomes established. Interesting comments there, but let's have a little bit of a look as we go forward into this conventional wisdom, as he puts it, um, namely uniformitarianism. We're going to have a look at the history of geology and we're going to have a look at fossils out of place. But before we do that, we need to establish principle two. Fast fossils. Fossils need to be formed fast. The presence of well-preserved macro fossils equals rapid deposition every single time, which goes against the standard story. Again, go and see the previous SFT um, interview where we talk about fish fossils and the like. And we had a few questions from that. In particular, we had a question asking me to provide um, where we got. So remember, I put up the diagram of the fish fossil that I said came from a museum. Um, they asked me which uh, museum did that come from, because surely that nothing would actually uh, promote that today. Well, here's the first one. This is from the um, Natural History Museum in Colchester, uh, how to get a fossil fish. And notice there, over millions of years, the mud becomes compressed into shale and minerals replace the structure of the bones fossilizing them. It's not just the Natural History Museum of Colchester. This was on display in the Sedgwick Museum, a famous geology and fossil museum in Cambridge, connected with Cambridge University. Notice just that comment at the bottom there. Fossils, this process that is fossilization, is very, very slow and can take over 10,000 years for a fossil to fall. Uh, this is layman stuff, by the way. You can also see similar signs like this in the Natural History Museum in London. Um, whether they're still up there, I don't know, but we've certainly got photos of them in the past from when John Mackay travelled there in sort of the 80s and 90s and so on and so forth, uh, and even more recent than that. This is promoted in books, in um, museums, around the world. What's interesting is a comment that I've uh, noticed is that that principle has been rejected at the academic level. Um, a lot of time in academia, you'll find that they accept that fossilization has to happen very, very quickly. They reject a flood or reject a worldwide flood at least, but it is certainly promoted at the layman level, which is interesting um, that that's the way that it actually works. But there's the evidence for you, uh, for those who asked it. Let's take a breather. Stop and take a deep breath. I mean, are you keeping up? Um, we've looked at a huge amount of stuff so far. We're diving into another list of stuff and you need to kind of hold your hats. And again, as, um, as uh, Standing for Truth has mentioned, you may want to watch this a few times to get it all into your head because we are going at full pelt here, but it takes a lot of work to refute the critics. As I was putting this together, uh, like I said, we could have been here for hours and hours and days and days going through all of the evidence, but we just simply do not have time. Okay, what have we looked at so far? We've looked at the fact that actual evidence is important, not just interpretation. You need to get a full picture. Modern deposits show very little similarity to the vast limestone beds. Um, what we haven't looked at so far is an in detailed look at non fossiliferous limestones and their chemical connections uh, and also bed sizes. But a reminder 
go to creationresearchuk.com, go to creationresearch.net and click on the Q&A site. Uh, or you can go there direct askjohnmackay.com. On here, you'll find a whole heap of questions which have been answered, including stuff on limestone and deposition and stuff like that. If your question isn't there, simply ping us off a question. We're constantly looking for new materials material to actually uh, go up there so hold your horses while we move on to the next part of this evening while i just grab a drink it's uh, it's interesting what you had to say about the um the limestone joe about um uh, it's not structurally well I've, I've found a few things about um modern day lime muds and um those that are found in in the grand canyon and uh mm -hmm. they pretty much confirm what you've said uh, uh, uh for example the size the canyon limestones are around four microns or less yeah whereas, whereas modern limestones are about 20 microns yeah yeah also, also with wa water currents that you mentioned the canyon limestones contain fossils with a dominant orientation showing that a yep. water current was operating whereas in the modern lime muds there's a lack of fossils with a dominant ori with a dominant orientation indicating lack of current action yeah so there's, there's also even a mineral difference between it i mean the uh, modern day uh, calcareous oozes are predominantly an aragonite based um, correct yeah uh sedimentary whereas in a lot of the limestone at least certainly things like the chalk and red wall limestone is predominantly calcite calcite, and calcite yeah. is, is really really easy to recognize uh really easy to do research with and stuff so you you know exactly what you're looking at so um yeah it's interesting uh, and, and uh, another comment i i've got to make joe about the present is the key to the past i was mm -hmm. reading an article this morning just this morning about gold and how it's formed Mm -hmm, Apparently, mm -hmm. some res some researchers in Australia have looked at earthquakes and fissures in granites, and mm -hmm. the change and the change in the pressure that occurs during the earthquake, and mm -hmm. they found that seams of gold actually formed. Get a lot of this within seconds. Mm. So. Yeah, it's it's there's there's a whole lot of uh, research that's been going on now, which the scientific community is very slowly starting to grasp hold of. Because I mean, you can understand why it's slow, in a sense, because you've been drilled into a specific way of thinking for so long. Um, and, and like one of our scientists, um, uh, Liam, who works with uh, Creation Research a lot, he's a gold geologist, and he, he he studies gold. He knows how gold supposedly formed. He also is a bible believer believes in creation and his work with um the gold deposits working from a biblical perspective has helped him find gold deposits uh where gold shouldn't be according to the secular story of how gold forms so he's very popular with his gold people um because he's finding them lots of gold but it's uh, it's interesting a lot of these scientists who are now starting to sort of get onto this bandwagon of process not time and they're finding things like opal formation silica formation so on and so yeah. forth uh, even coal and oil it's predominantly a process and has nothing to do with time uh, what they haven't done yet is correlate that to the main geological record if you like but we're finding out more and more of this stuff it's the same with i mean a whole other aspect of uh, limestone which we haven't gone into is uh, splenotherms so um stalactites and stalagmites and uh, cave formation and so on and so forth and there seems to be a very predominant when you're dealing with calcium carbonate and with things like silica there seems to be a very predominant chemical connection there uh, and one that is connected specifically to uh, biology to, to biochemicals and bacteria and uh, rotting vegetation and so on and so forth and that's a whole fascinating discovery which again is another four-hour topic that we could go on to but um, what we're going to do in the, the, the next part is we're going to try and deal with what you might call the foundations of all of this um, so it, sh it should be it should be interesting let's uh, hopefully everybody's had a breather and uh, a chance to um, run to the toilet and whatnot because what we're going to do now is have a look at Go on, sorry, go ahead, George. Joe, I was just, I was just going to uh, re reiterate that point you made about a creationist. Listen to this, shock horror. A creationist has made predictions about where to find gold. And yep. they say that creationists don't make predictions. Hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you can find out more. I mean, I think specifically they talked about uh, Liam on um, uh, one of our uh, videos um, uh, called Darwin on the Rocks. It's not Times of Darwin, it's Darwin on the Rocks, which you can stream, by the way, at creationresearchlive.com. Um, <laughs> but if you go, again, if you go on to uh, Ask John Mackay, I'm pretty sure there's an article on there by Liam. Uh, there certainly are articles on there by Liam, but I'm pretty sure there's one on there about gold and him talking about gold. Um it's an interesting uh, area where um, he's in what you might call academia. He's done academic work with gold and so on and so forth, and he's in a professional geological environment. Uh, but his the people who employ him really don't care about what he believes because he's finding them gold at the end of the day, and um, you know that that makes them <laughs> that makes them happy. So um, yeah, there's some fascinating stuff there about p predictions and, and and where gold should have formed, where gold has been found, where it shouldn't be formed, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, well, actually, we're going to we're going to delve a little bit into that that history side of stuff and where this sort of uh, agenda, if you like, actually came from. So, if we're ready, dive into part two. Yep. Okay, okay fossil and geology history. Um, it goes back further than you think. Um, yeah, we're going to do a little bit of history now. The key phrase for part two of our program is this, the present is the key to the past, the concept which is the basis of a vast amount of geology today. Specifically, we're going to start with dealing with deep time and antiquity, uh, Sumerians, Babylonians and Hindus. And you say, what on earth has this got to do with geology? Um, well, quite a lot, actually, if you look into it. And by the way, this is, uh, again, a whistle stop tour. We are not going to deal with all of the um, issues surrounding this. We're not going to deal uh, with all of the uh, information around this. Uh, we go into a bit more detail in our book, um, Charmouth and Black Then, where we in the in-depth section. So I encourage people to get that uh, and watch the free video which goes with it, which doesn't go into this topic, but uh, it sort of covers the whole issue of fossilization. Um, but in the, in, the, in the back of the book that we wrote, it, it deals with this issue of deep time and antiquity and where did this whole idea come from uh, and we're actually working on a, on a production now which will hopefully look into this a lot deeper so uh, this is a very whistle-stop tour we're not going to deal with all of this topic but let's go to have a look at archaeology to the Sumerian king list uh, the Sumerian king list can actually be correlated with the bible um, it talks about 10 pre-flood kings uh, uh, which you can find reference to 10 pre-flood patriarchs as they're called back in Genesis Adam through to Noah, basically, uh, or, or, or Lamech, anyway. Uh, so a lot of, uh, obviously, a lot of archaeologists and historians will claim that the Bible was influenced by the Sumerians or the Babylonians uh, when they were in um, captivity and so on and so forth. That's a whole other topic. Um, it's not particularly relevant here, uh, but that's a whole other topic. And you can find more about that on creationresearch.net. And there's plenty of other evidence for that in various other websites as well, uh, Answers and Genesis and the like. So go and check that out. We haven't got time now. But the point is, it can be correlated with the Bible. Ten pre-flood kings, uh, according to um, the Sumerian king list, where there was a global flood, according to the Sumerians, uh, and before that there reigned ten pre-flood kings, which can be correlated to the ten pre-flood patriarchs in the Bible. Now, this Sumerian king list um, was actually interpreted by Barossus, uh, who was the chief um, priest of the Babylonian god Marduk. Um, Marduk, or uh, Merak, by the way, is mentioned in the Bible, also known as Bel, uh, and specifically it's in Jeremiah, towards the end of Jeremiah, uh, where he's prophesies it, prophesying um, over the Babylonians and saying, you know, Bel, where are your statues? Marduk, where is your power now? Because the great god, uh, Jehovah, has actually crushed you. So it's an interesting little biblical references there. But it, it was interpreted, the Sumerian king list, uh, down through the ages, was passed down from the Sumerians to the Assyrians to the Babylonians in that general Chaldean area of the Middle East. It was interpreted by Barossus to cover a reign of 432,000 years between creation and the flood. Now, this was greatly extended or greatly exaggerated from the original Sumerian king list and obviously far greatly um, uh, exaggerated or stretched from the biblical record uh, between Adam and 
and um, uh, and the flood. So this has been stretched to our first real reference of deep time, deep time or millions of years, if you like. It's a sort of a, a well-known phrase um, in the history of geology, deep time, millions of years. So Barossus interpreted the Sumerian king list to cover a reign of 432,000 years. And he added this as part of the Babylonian cosmological history. The Babylonians, uh, by the way, stuck to a sexagesimal um, sort of history of the world, similar to how the Hindus do, based on multiples of 60, right? Uh, so he placed this 432,000 years between creation and the flood. He then claimed that an additional 1,680,000 years had actually happened prior to the Sumerian king list. So you had 432,000 years as the Sumerian king list. He claimed that 1,680,000 years occurred prior to the Sumerian king list. He then claimed that the flood, so that's the end of the Sumerian king list to Alexander the Great, um, was uh, 36,000 years, and he predicted a further 12,000 years of history, which would bring the total history of the cosmos to 2,160,000 years, which is a uh, 60 is a uh, figure that goes into it. It's divisible of 60. Um, so that comes into the uh, sexagesimal um, sort of uh, idea or philosophy uh, regarding the way that the cosmos worked in regard to their philosophy and their pagan beliefs. All right. So you find this whole sort of uh, sexagesimal system, this whole sort of deep time thing goes way back to the Sumerian king list. Uh, so it goes way back to whether you want to believe in um, uh, the biblical version of history or whether you want to believe in the secular version of history. It goes back a very long way to sort of what's considered the dawn of civilization, uh, the cradle of civilization and the dawn of civilization, according to secular history or the early post flood world, post Babel world, if you want to take the biblical history. So you've got this interesting interesting reference to millions of years um, way back with the Babylonians. Take a step forward to Hindu cosmology, which was greatly affected by the Sumerian and Babylonian theology and philosophy. You can see a lot of similarities between the two. The Hindu system is also based on that pagan sexagesimal system, um, and they actually adopted it from that sort of first foundations of Babylonian and Sumerian sort of uh, uh, pagan philosophy. However, they extended the history from millions to billions of years. In fact, uh, throughout history, it's fluctuated how old they believe the Earth was, but um, it's even been on the, on the uh, realm of trillions of years, which I think is where they are now with their Hindu philosophy. Uh, obviously, they then incorporated a regeneration um, or reincarnation philosophy where you were reincarnated. Uh, there was a, a continual cycle. So the universe is uh, eternal and you constantly regenerate. Uh, the present is the key to the past, that things that are happening now have always happened in the past. There's that principle again. The present is the key to the past. Everything that's happening now is how we interpret the past. Of course, with an internal universe, you still need to base it upon a sexagesimal uh, system. So they believe that the cosmos was actually the god Brahma, uh, whose lifespan totaled 311,040 billion years. So that's just over 311 trillion years. They predicted that a further 12,000 years of history would continue um, uh, from the from from the um, uh, Babylonian sort of ideology that they actually interpreted, which means their total cosmos history uh, was 2,160,000 years, similar to the Babylonians. So they've actually gone from millions to now billions of years. Uh, folks, are we still there? Yeah, I can hear you. Jo I can hear you, you Joe. Me? You, okay. You, you, yeah, you I mute. can hear you. No, that's right. I wasn't sure whether it was whether it was working or not. It went a bit strange for a second. Never mind. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as long as you can all hear me, that's the important bit. Moving yeah. on to the next stage of our story, and I hope you're sort of following along here. Can you see how the Hindus were affected by? The Babylonians, the Babylonians, which were based upon real history of the Bible, which got in, 
uh, incorporated and uh, a bit corrupted into a concept of millions of years based upon their rejection of scripture. They'd rejected scripture. We know that uh, the Babylonians and the Sumerians had access to the scriptures and had access to the true story of the universe, if you want to, through the Jewish people being stuck there for many years. Even Daniel, the whole story of the Daniel and being stuck with the Babylonians and the Persians and so on and so forth. Um, they had access to this stuff, but they'd chosen to reject it. They'd chosen to reject it and as a result they came to a concept of millions of years the hindus took that to a concept of billions or even trillions of years and then we come to greek philosophy Greek philosophy was affected by both the Babylonian and Hindu philosophy, which you can see in their pagan system, their belief of many gods, and so on and so forth. They didn't adhere to a uh, sexagesimal system, but they did. You can see many similarities between their pagan ideas. But then what they began to do is, later on in the Greeks' time, they actually began to reject a sort of theological philosophy. They began to reject an idea of many gods. Uh, they began to sort of get rid of that idea and begin to adopt particular people like the atomists and so on and so forth, began to adopt a naturalistic philosophy based on the concept seen in Middle Eastern ideology. So they took some of the concepts, they took the naturalistic concepts from uh, Hindu and uh, Babylonian and Assyrian and Sumerian uh, pagan philosophy and took the naturalistic ideas and began to build upon them, particularly this concept of the present being the key to the past. Uh, several of them actually began to promote this idea of an early primordial soup philosophy uh, to explain the naturalistic origin of life. They claimed that we'd all evolved out of the goo and it was a very racist form of evolution because they believed that um, they had evolved, the Greeks, the white people, had evolved out of better quality goo than the Jews had. Um, even back then you could see the races in between the two people groups. Uh, so interesting little bit of history there, but you can see they believed in something remarkably similar to that which Erasmus Darwin, uh, many thousand years later, would actually um, promote or certainly go back to the Greek pagan roots, which then Charles Darwin, who was Erasmus' gran uh, Darwin's grandson, um, actually went on to promote in the theory of evolution. You could also see a, a very early natural selection philosophy uh, based on the natural arising of what they called hopeful creatures, which were creatures which could come about by themselves with particular traits which helped them to gain success in the world and leave behind the less hopeful creatures who would die out. Very similar to Darwin's sort of uh, theory of natural selection. Well, starting way back in the Greeks, interesting. They also believed that this was a constant cycle and attributed many millions of years, this present is the key to the past philosophy, to their pagan uh, ideas. And then we have the Greek philosophy um, dominating medieval Europe, particularly in the case of the study. I was talk, I'm sure I talked last time about Nicholas Stino and the discovery of shark's teeth and tongue stones. And it's a fascinating study and one that we could take a long time on. But what's interesting is, although the Greeks sort of gained uh, grip of the scientific, if you want to call it, investigations down through the Medi Middle Ages, what was there was a very religious, uh, you might even call Christian, even though predominantly Roman Catholic, but certainly when you had the first beginning of the Enlightenment, people like Nicholas Stino, who established the um, process of um, stratigraphy or superposition, uh, and also determined that fossils really were fossils, remains of the past. Uh, people like um, Sir Isaac Newton, people uh, uh, like Francis Bacon, uh, who sort of established what we now recognise as modern science, attributed their work to a belief in the Creator, a belief in the Bible. There's no denying that if you look enough into history, right? But then what happened is it was the French who really began to promote once again, a naturalistic history of the world. The French revolutionary thinkers, they'd got rid of the patriarchy and they began to revolutionize. You see, back then, there, just as it was in England, there was the belief that God um, spoke to his people or God communicated to his people um, in a way that ruled with kingship. So the king was appointed by God and the king who was in charge of the country was there by appointment of God, special appointment of God. That's what all the argument between Henry VIII and the Pope was, who was the head of the church. And the belief back then, uh, even as the belief back now in tradition, even though it's not te technically believed, 
believed in the UK anymore. The tradition, when you see uh, a new coronation, if you go back and watch Elizabeth's coronation, it is based upon the Bible. It's based upon you have been appointed this by, position by God which is a biblical, um, it is actually a biblical uh, uh, point, by the way. Uh, God, the Bible does say that God puts rulers and kings and people in charge. So interesting little comment, but the French revolutionary thinkers did not like the patriarchy. They did not like the monarchy. They did not like this idea that there was a God who appointed people in charge of them. So they actually took inspiration from the Greeks' naturalistic philosophies, names like de Malay, Buffon, Voltaire, uh, so on and so forth. It was the French that really began to popularize this idea of naturalistic uh, evolution. They claimed things like fossils are inorganic. There's no way that they could have possibly formed uh, in a flood. There was no way a flood could have been possible. Um, the Earth is at least two billion years old. That was put forward by Voltaire. Uh, life arises naturally. Um, Buffon, I think, actually uh, claimed, or no, sorry, it was Voltaire who claimed that fossils were uh, just leftover bones from medieval pilgrims. The whole point of this promotion of millions, or in this case, billions of years, the whole point of this promotion of hearkening back to the ancient Greek philosophies, which themselves were based on the Hindu philosophies and the Babylonian philosophies, which themselves were based upon a rejection of scripture. The very same scripture that the French revolutionaries were also trying to reject here and promote a naturalistic worldview, which has no adherence to a higher authority, including God and the king. Skip forward to Hutton, who took the ideas and the work of people like de Malay, Buffon and Voltaire, um, who actually began to promote a concept called uniformitarianism. His catchphrase really was, the present is the key to the past, that we can explain all things, all natural things, whether that's um, geology or whether that's, um, you know, natural life arising and so on and so forth. We can actually explain this using present day processes. Note that at the, up to this point, no science science, no observational, testable experiments have actually happened. We are all about philosophying uh, or, or, or building upon a philosophy. It was a rejection of scripture that caused the Babylonians and the Syrians and Sumerians and Chaldeans to reject the biblical um, word of God and to actually promote a millions of years worldview. It was the rejection of of scripture and the rejection of the one true God that caused the initial Hindus to take on that Babylonian uh, structure and develop it into billions or trillions of years. It was a rejection of God and scripture because we know that the Greeks knew about uh, the Bible. Paul went there and preached the gospel to them, to the philosophers, uh, even on one of the most famous areas of philosophy uh, in the Greek world, Mars Hill. Mm, interesting. But they rejected it and built upon a naturalistic worldview based upon a rejection of scripture. And here we find the French revolutionary thinkers, the in French Enlightenment, uh, actually hearkening back to that anti-biblical agenda in the promotion of their naturalistic ideas. No science has actually happened yet. Then enter Charles Lyell. 1797 to 1875. Um, he took the work of James Hutton, who built upon the French revolutionaries, who built upon the Greeks, who built upon the Hindus and the Babylonians, who built upon a rejection of scripture. And he also used this principle, the present is the key to the past. Here you can see his picture in the Natural History Museum in London. We took this photograph. The ideas taken from Charles Lyell put into this uh, process. Lyle and Darwin, the time team. You can see Lyle on the left-hand side. You can see Charles Darwin there. What's the connection between the two of them? Well, Charles Lyle was Charles Darwin's mentor. Um, he had been taken, Charles Darwin had been taken his grandfather's ideas, Erasmus Darwin. He was sort of contemporary uh, with those French revolutionary thinkers and liked this concept of a natural philosophy, like the concept that the Greeks had been promoting, and had actually began to write down some ideas about it. And Charles Darwin had taken his grandfather's ideas and wanted to run with them. But he needed some real good people to be behind him to help him in his promotion of his book and promotion of his ideas so that he could actually take it forward and Charles Lyell was the man to do that. Here we are on a creation research field trip a few years back. These are rocks which we now call Ordovician. Ordovician, by the way, has nothing to do with millions of years or evolution. It has everything to do with the um, uh, tribe, uh, the Celtic tribe living in south of Wales, uh, not too far away from where I am now. Um, called the Ordovici tribe. That Ordovici tribe, by the way, are 
Egyptians made sure of that. Um, however, if you go to the rocks where around where the Ordovician tribe lived, you can find some other extinct creatures buried in the rocks. These are the trilobites. And so they actually named the rocks which contain the extinct creatures after the extinct tribe that used to live on top of those rocks, which is where we get the name Ordovician from. Nothing to do with millions of years of evolution, but this is actually in Canada, and um, this is actually another famous fossil place where Charles Darwin and Charles Lyell were documented to have gone and actually wrote about it. Here you can see some of our researchers. We had a wonderful day digging up fossils, and you can see one of their fossils there. It's a fossil snail. Oh, the fossil snail is the one on the left-hand side there buried in the rock. Um, the modern-day snail shell that we found on the floor uh, is just next to it. Uh, it's still a snail. Um, Ordovician, supposedly 400 and so million years old. Hmm, interesting. Okay, there's our species of snail. Modern on the right, fossil on the left. You see, Charles Lyell was there and he said to Charles Darwin, according to your theory of evolution, um, how long do you think it would take from one type of snail to evolve into a new type of snail? And Charles Darwin said, well, I don't think 20 million years would be that unlikely. OK, so according to this philosophy, uh, each species of snail took 20 million years to evolve into a different snail, into the next species of snail. OK, therefore, the Ordovician rocks, because you can count them up from the bottom to the top, count how many different species of snail they are. Uh, if it's 20 million years each one, calculate it up and you find the Ordovician is 240 million years old. By the way, the Ordovician is now believed to be a lot older than that, about 250 or so million years old. So um, it's an interesting little uh, comment that the vast majority of these dates are not actually based on evidence. They're actually based on the latest scientific theory or hypothesis. But you can kind of see how these vast ages started to come about by the promotion of Charles Lyell uh, and his publication of the principles of geology. The key concepts, he promoted evolution that his um, friend Charles Darwin was also promoting based upon the ideas of Erasmus Darwin, which were based upon the pagan Greek philosophy, which were based upon the Sumerians' rejection of scripture. He was anti-catastrophe. Um, didn't like the idea of a global flood. And his concept was you can tell the age of the rock by the fossils that are in it. That was the whole principle. And it's a principle which is still being used today. Darwin's age in Earth. Here's a nice little quote um, published by Darwin himself on the origin of species by means of natural selection and so on and so forth. It's a wonderfully long name. But this is what he says. He says, hence, under ordinary circumstances, I conclude that for a cliff 500 feet in height, a denutation of one inch per century or a depositation or a deposition of one inch per century for the whole length would be an ample allowance. Hey, that's a pretty slow rate. In fact, he goes on to say at this rate, on the above data, the deposition, if you like, of this well, that's the Weldon uh, beds, which I've dug up, the Weldon bed, they're down on the Isle of Wight and in Hastings, wonderful dinosaur fossils in them. Um, the deposition of the well must have required 306,662,400 years, or say 300 million years. Hey, these are some big rates that he's um, quoting about here. Um, Dinosaurs are on the world. Modern Cretaceous, uh, Mantel, Ziguanodon, Baryonyx. I've dug up dinosaurs uh, from the Isle of Wight. Wonderful stuff from the world. Um, there's in one of the local museums on the Isle of Wight. Um, dinosaurs died out 300 million years ago. That's what Darwin is claiming, according to his philosophy. When was the last time you heard dinosaurs died out? Uh, the number which is being bandied around today is 65 million years, not 300 million years. But then don't be surprised because Charles Darwin's um, data was based off of pure assumption, false information, a false philosophy. And oh, by the way, for all of the critics out there who are having a go at my, my academic background, which was kind of dealt with as an ad hominem, just remember that I have way more qualifications than Charles Darwin ever did. Um, his main qualification was in theology. He knew exactly what he was fighting against. Interesting thought. He continues, Call, consequently, if my theory is true, it is indisputable that before the lower Silurian stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed, as long as, or probably far longer than, the whole interval from the Silurian age to the present day, and that these vast, yet quite unknown periods of time, the world swarmed with living creatures. He is already accepting that there were vast periods of time, even though he doesn't actually know what those vast periods of time are. How old? 
vast ages. He's giving ages of 600 million years plus, long before the invention of anything like radioactive dating, long before the invention of anything like modern dating records. He's still giving a concept of many millions of years. Motives for aiding the Earth? Because you have to remember that Charles Darwin's uh, philosophy, his promotion of evolution, was based upon the same principles that Charles Lyell was teaching him uh, and what Charles Lyell had been promoting in the principles of geology. Charles Darwin took uh, uh, the books of the principles of geology on the famous Beagle voyage. What was Charles Lyell's motives for making very large ages for the Earth? Well, he explained to himself, Catherine Lyell, the life letters and journals of Sir Charles Lyell, you can pick it up and read it. These are letters which he wrote to his friends and his contemporaries. He said this, Charles Lyell himself, I conceived the idea five or six years ago, so that would have been uh, 1824 to 1825, um, so on and so forth, that if I ever, that if ever, the mosaic geology, that is the geology based upon the Bible, the details that Moses gave us, flood geology, so on and so forth. I conceived the idea five or six years ago that if ever the mosaic geology could be set down without giving offence, it would be in a historical sketch, and you must extract mine in order to say as little possible about yourself. In other words, what he's saying is, if we can ever get rid of this idea of the Bible, then it's going to be actually making it about history. It's going to be making it about millions of years. It's going to be making about the earth. It's going to be about making the earth too old for the Bible to be true. Stephen Jay Gold very well-known uh, paleontologist, very controversial paleontologist, evolutionist and mm, secular atheist. He said this about Charles Lyell. Um, Charles Lyell was a lawyer by profession, and his book is one of the most brilliant briefs published by an advocate. Lyell relied upon true bits of cunning to establish his unif unif uniformitarian views as the only true geology. Charles Lyell knew exactly what he was doing. His agenda was to get rid of the Bible. His agenda was not based on evidence. It was not based on good, solid evidence that he'd travelled and observed. He was basing his entire agenda around removing the Bible, and he was doing so by borrowing concepts from the pagan Greeks, who had borrowed their concepts from the Hindus and the Babylonians, who had rejected scripture hundreds, if not thousands, of years before. Old continues. First, he, Charles Lyell, set up a straw man to demolish. In fact, the ge catastrophists were much more empirically minded than Lyell. The geologic record does seem to require catastrophes. Rocks are fractured and contorted. The whole faunas are wiped out. Now, what Gold is basically saying here is in modern geology, there is an acknowledgement that catastrophes are required, whether it's major volcan volcanism activities or major mudslides. And that goes on in some of the questions that we were asked last time and what we may get on to in the Q&A session, um, a lot of geologists today uh, might consider themselves neo-catastrophists or certainly accept that catastrophes are required as part of the geological history. But what Gold is saying here is that uh, what Lyell actually did was basically claim that, um, you know, uh, basically claim that the catastrophes are physically impossible, um, even though they are now recognised as being necessary. But what Charles Lyell succeeded in doing is giving the foundations of geology um, basically a this, this uniformitarian, this present is the key to the past basis. Now that's important as we go on. What is the real problem? This is the real problem. The present is the key to the past. Because even though many geologists today accept that catastrophes are necessary, they still have not left this underlying concept, which is actually based upon that pagan philosophy, um, which Charles Lyell uh, took from James Hutton and promoted. You see, the Bible actually says the present is not the key to the past. The Bible that says that the past is the key to the present. The explanations in this book here, the Bible, um, the history which gives us explains why we are in the position that we're in today. It explains why there are bad things happening. It explains why there's so much sin and death and suffering. It explains why we need a saviour. The past recorded in Genesis, the past recorded in the Bible, is the key to the position which we are in today. Um, that's the opposite of the modern philosophical thinking behind all of geology. Here's the uh, biblical picture, Adam living to 930. Hey, you notice that top? It's also a comment on the climate change. Warm and cool, rain, summer, winter, hail, snow, drought. Hey, 
affects climate change. But you need to tune in on Saturday uh, to watch me and John in discussion with that or go and watch our new climate documentary or some of the other climate presentations that we've done. Um, but this is the history which explains why we are in the position that we're in today. Um, interesting what you can actually find. Problem one, note very well, any dating method, any dating method, geological dating method, for instance, carbon-14, starlight and the supposed time problem, radioactive dates, carbon-14 dates, or chalk and limestone deposition or formation, or any geological history which has been based on Lyell's uniformitarian assumption will every single time without fail contradict the biblical account of day six creation and the flood because charles lyell said that if i conceived the idea that if ever the mosaic geology the biblical geology could be set down without giving offense it would be by uh contradicting its age hmm, interesting um anything that is based upon Lyle's uniformitarian assumption will always contradict the Bible because the uniformitarian assumption itself started out way back with the Sumerians and the Babylonians as a rejection of scripture. So therefore, any modern geological process which is based upon that uniformitarian assumption will always contradict the Bible without any doubt. I mean, it's always going to. The issue is, and this is the big thing which you try and get across to the skeptics and the atheists, um, you're basing it on an assumption. You're basing it on essentially no evidence. You're basing your entire philosophy uh, that the present is the key to the past. You're basing it off of one man's agenda, one man's uh, uh, goal to actually remove the Bible from science. Hey, that has everything to do with religion, or specifically anti-religion. So no, science isn't the uh, uh, pure, unbiased thing that you once thought it was. Interesting. Lyle's aim, his own words, to free the science from Moses, June 1830. Lyle's aim, in his own words, was to free the science from Moses. Moses? Oh, this really shows you his genius as a lawyer. Moses, he didn't, want, he didn't say the Bible. He didn't say creation. He didn't say the flood. He said Moses. Why Moses? Well, Moses is attributed to writing the first five books of the Bible, isn't he? Or certainly accumulating them all together and sort of um, uh, putting them together and compiling them. What do you find in uh, the first uh, five books in the Bible, Moses's books? Well, not only do you find the uh, definition or the story or the account of creation, you also find the account of the fall. The reason why mankind is in the mess he is today is because we are accountable to a righteous and holy God. And if we disobey him, there are going to be consequences and we're currently living in them. Ah, if you get rid of the fall, you get rid of an accountability to God. You get rid of a geological history recorded in Noah's flood, which is, by the way, the result of God's judgment on mankind. Oh, there's a God who judges. Yeah, there is. There's a God who judges and he judges you when you break his laws. Ah, get rid of Moses, you get rid of that God who judges. You also get rid of the real racial history of mankind spreading out through the Tower of Babel, explaining that we all go back to Adam. There is no such thing as uh, different, uh, uh, you know, different species of people or different subspecies of people. There are many different cult, you know, cultural backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds and races, but they all go back to Adam. We're all made of one blood. Um, and so you open up a path for dominance in the philosophy and the sort of society. Um, you get rid of any accountability to God that way. And also, um, even though Genesis is uh, and Exodus is predominantly history, also in here we have the law, the law of God, the law of God, uh, which he gives to people, the law of God, which if you don't follow, um, you are a sinner. By the way, you are a sinner. There's no even point in really looking to see if you are, because uh, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But do you see what Lyle's aim here is to do? Free science from Moses? It was to free science. It was to free people's thinking from any concept of an authority, a higher authority, any concept of a God. Um, and that's really where this agenda lies. The entire uniformitarian millions of years deep time is based upon a rejection of scripture, a willful, knowledgeable rejection of scripture, and not based on science in the slightest. Note well, it is not the evidence that disagrees with the biblical record of six-day creation and Noah's flood over the last six to seven thousand years. It's the opinions of men who willfully set out to reject and replace God's word. Um, 
see 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 4 to 7. That's some homework assignment for our watchers uh, and read um, some interesting concepts in there as well. You see, Lyle replaced Genesis. Um, he replaced the need for a short term. He said, hey, we can actually have a world which is very, very old. So that actually paved the way for Darwin to rewrite it. Um, if you replace Genesis, you can actually rewrite the way that history uh, turned out and you can rewrite the origin of life on Earth. And Charles Darwin did so by basing it upon naturalistic ideas, which the Greeks had laid down uh, millennia earlier, which were themselves based upon the pagan Babylonian and Hindu ideologies. Interesting where history leads you, isn't it? Darwin's theology. Oh yeah, I mentioned this earlier. Charles Darwin had his degree in theology. Um, but have a look at what he said here. I had gradually come by this time to see that the Old Testament from its manifestly false history of the world with the Tower of Babel, the rainbow as a side, etc, etc, and from its attributing to God the feelings of a revengeful tyrant um, was no more to be trusted than the sacred book of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. Interesting, though, that he actually took the beliefs of the Hindus, uh, and in, if, whether he knew, did it knowingly or not, he took inspiration from the Hindus uh, to actually formulate his theory of evolution, a pagan theory, not a scientific one. Then, Golden Lyell. To circumnavigate the literal appearance, that's the biblical appearance in the fossil record, Lyle imposed his imagination upon the evidence. The geological record, he argued, is extremely imperfect, imperfect and we must interpolate into it um, into uh, what we can reasonably infer but cannot see. The catastrophists were the hard-nosed empiricists of their day, not the blinded theological apologists. Interesting where history actually leads you, but I'm pretty sure you've never heard this point of view before. Remember, Lyle's aims was to free science from Moses. Nothing to do with evidence in the slightest. And there's Lyle's most famous disciple, Charles Darwin, the promoter of the theory of evolution based upon his grandfather's ideas, which were themselves based upon um, the pagan Greek ideas, based themselves upon, as we've said many times, a rejection of scripture. But Darwin said this himself. I always feel that my books came half out of Lyle's brain and that I never acknowledged this sufficiently. Hmm. Interesting to see the connections of history. But you've probably never heard of that before. How old? By the latter part of the 19th century, Lyell and Darwin were using rates of erosion and deposition to estimate that the Earth was hundreds of millions of years old, long before any invention of carbon-14 or so on and so forth. Um, geologists actually knew that the Earth was old uh, long before they knew how old it was. The point of all this if you take the pagan-inspired philosophy that Lyle and Darwin promoted as your authority, then you're going to have issues accepting the Bible's version of events. But make sure you realise that it is not an issue of evidence, it's an issue of who or what your authority is. Whether it's an ideology promoted by Charles Darwin and Charles Lyell based upon a pagan rejection of scripture, or it is the biblical history itself. Um, the whole issue here is who is your authority. A reminder, go to creationresearch.net, click on our Q&A site. You can find out plenty more uh, on there as we go. Um, I don't know if we've got time for this or not. Like I say, I've got no idea um, how long this presentation was actually going to take. Um, I don't know how, I mean, I'm happy to carry on going, um, guys, if you're there. Uh, I, this is the last bit. This bit may take mm. uh, just under 10 minutes if I look at the out-of-place fossils, but it's entirely up to you whether you want to keep going or whether you want to throw it open to questions now. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I just want to be um, respectful of your time, Joe, because to be honest, I'm absolutely you, fine. OK, I, I, I can listen to you all day. So <laughs> you take your time. You take your time. OK, cool. Well, we'll jo finish jo up this then. Go Joseph, be Joseph, before before you go on to the outer place fossils, mm -hmm. it was interesting. It was interesting. Uh, you showed those um, ages of the main characters in the Bible. Uh, yeah. Having done having done statistical analysis, well, almost forty five years ago now. But uh, one of the things they taught us, uh, and statistical analysis, by the way, is a relatively new type of uh, mathematics. Uh, mm -hmm. When you when you do a statistical analysis on those ages with a best fit curve, you get an R squared value of zero point nine six. Now, for those that have done statistical analysis. An R square value of 0.9 or above is considered a very accurate fit. Now, now this is the thing. How did goat herders who wrote 
who wrote the Bible over thousands of years know anything about statistical analysis and conspired to get it so accurately with today's mathematics? Yeah, and you can find all of this kind of uh, similar um, concepts throughout the Bible as well. There's so much evidence for it being inspired. It is, it's, just, it's just remarkable. Yeah. It really is remarkable. All right, let's dive into this last bit then, out of place fossils, and we're going to tie it back a little bit to uh, what we were talking about earlier with limestone. We're going back to limestone. Specifically, we're going to the Tennessee. A challenge for Christians out there. Yes, I know if you're an atheist watching tonight, you're not going to take this uh, very well, but never mind. Um, it's great, by the way, having so many atheists watching us. As uh, This is a ministry at the end of the day. We're here to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, uh, half the time, the, the difficulty is actually uh, getting people to sit and listen to you. So it's wonderful that there's so many atheists listening to us. It is fantastic. Uh, a challenge to Christians out there, though, you need to start saying things God's way. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. Make sure you have Christ's mind on. All right, let's take you to Jurassic Ark. Um, there it is there, it's Australia. George, you know the place well. Uh, there's uh, Jurassic Ark up in Queensland, a little bit away from where you are, George. And uh, let's go to our outdoor creation museum that I've been involved with in the past with the research uh, and uh, the, the, the talks and stuff there and designing and stuff. This has a, been a long-term project. Back in 2012, uh, creation research established walk from Adam to Australia, a walk through the Bible from the beginning of time to the present day. And uh, 2018, by 2018, when I visited there and did some work there, it was a fabulous tropical paradise. Um, so let's uh, delve into uh, some of the science that we have there and some of the different things we have on display. We take school kids round and we show them things like this. Sharp, pointy, prickly cactuses. You stick one of those in you and you do not think that it's very good in the slightest. Although... It's only actually the lower thorns that are hard and spiky. You can actually see the differences here. Um, you can go down the plant and you can see the hard white woody thorns come up to the top and they're bendy. They're soft. They wouldn't impale you in the slightest. Interesting. Um, this actually goes into the science behind thorns and how thorns actually get produced because in every single case, thorns are either a mutation or they're based upon a mutation, um, which is either a failed stem growth or a failed leaf bud growth or a specific mutation which has caused the plant to produce thorny structures. Uh, the scientific difference between them is a prickle or a thorn. Um, here you can also see some wonderful bromeliads, a purple pineapple there, or, or a pink pineapple. And you can see our sharp thorns. I mean, run your finger along there and it will impale you. These thorns actually come from a recession of the plant material. The veins which distribute uh, water and uh, sugar to the plant leaves and down into the roots, into the centre of the plant, um, actually are made of silica, very, very hard, sharp glass. And if a mutation happens, I mean, you can see a mutation has happened on this plant because the green is what produces the sugar. The white is completely useless. And so a mutation has happened, which has caused the plant to begin to shrink back. But the hard, sharp silica bits, um, they still remain there. They can't shrink back. They're made of glass. And so you end up with sharp thorns that stick out. Painful stuff. Really sharp stuff. Here's the origin of thorns according to evolution. Um, soft, squidgy plants like seaweed evolved into land plants like ferns, uh, flower, flowerless plants like ferns, uh, which evolved into flowering plants. By the way, uh, the evolution of flat flowering plants is one of the theories uh, as to why the dinosaurs went extinct. It was that they couldn't cope with the pollen. Wonderful theories behind dinosaurs' extinction according to evolution. Hilarious as well. You should try to check it out sometime. Um, and then the story goes that these flowering plants were so fed up with being munched on by animals that they even ended up evolving thorns, mutations which produce thorns, which stop the animals from eating them. Of course, if you've worked as a f uh, zookeeper or a farmer like I have, you know it doesn't stop the animals from eating them in the slightest. So that's a failure on evolution's part there. But there's your standard story of evolution of thorns from simple cells, uh, simple squidgy plants up to flowering plants producing thorns as protection. Let's take you to the biblical point. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis chapter 3. Then God said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and has eaten from the tree which I commanded of you, saying, You shall not eat of it. The ground is cursed for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. According to the Bible, thorns and thistles were not onto the planet until after mankind sinned, until after mankind was on the planet. What's the difference this makes, and more importantly, what on earth has this got to do with out-of-place fossils? Well, let's dig in a little bit deeper. See, according to the Bible, plants were created with no thorns, and then after the curse, they ended up having thorns, as a result of the curse that God put onto the planet, uh, producing thorns. According to the Bible, if you take the Bible as real history, according to the Bible, thorns were on the planet after mankind sinned. Therefore, thorns were on the planet only after mankind, Adam, was on the planet. You see, the point here, first point is change is definitely true, but it's not evolution. Um, according to the Bible, roses changed. They changed from thornless to thorny. And now we try and breed them back to thornless, but their flowers and their scent are nowhere near as good as the thorny ones. Hmm, interesting. Here's creation researchers' first fossil thorn. Wonderful neuropterous plant with great big thorny things sticking out the side there. Fabulous stuff. Um, you see the thorn? Nobody would mistake that as a thorn. That was, by the way, in Nova Scotia in Canada. And then a few years back, um, John Mackay, our international director, uh, was in Carthage in Tennessee, digging up some nice fossils from, hey, limestone. Um, Ordovician limestone, by the way. Uh, supposedly 450 million years old, which is the latest uh, idea. Of course, I couldn't let John do all the good fossils for himself. So I visited there in January 2021. That was last year, just before the COVID uh, stuff hit. And um, I actually, it was about a week or two after this photograph was taken that I had to pack my bags and run for the hills, uh, or specifically run for England, because uh, they were worried that I wouldn't actually get back into it. So January 2020 and November 2019, I went and started digging up some of these fossils. Here's our geological authority. Bob Powell, he worked for the Tennessee Division of Geology. Uh, he's worked with uh, the University of Tennessee. He's mapped a huge amount of these um, rocks professionally, and he also uh, maps them accordance to in accordance to the secular dates, which were published by the university and the Tennessee Division of Geology. Um, even though he believes that the Bible is true from the very beginning, he's done a lot of good geological surveying work. I was with him digging up some fossils, and look what we found in this Ordovician limestone. Um, land plants. Specifically, can you see the thorns sticking out of the side of these land plants where the arrows are? Let's get a, a little pointer up here to give you a little bit of a help because uh, they're quite small, these plants, by the way. Um, but you can see there's a thorn there, a thorn there, and a thorn there. Move up, there's another one hidden under there, there's one there, so on and so forth. It's all over the place, these wonderful thorns. Um, here's John Mackay with Hey, look what he's pointing to with his thumb there uh, on the left-hand side. It's a fossil sea creature, a fossil brachiopod. And then on here, you can see his finger pointing to all these elongated lines. These are all fossil plants. In fact, they're so well preserved, we can even identify what kind of plant they are. They're lycopod, commonly known today as club mosses. Um, hmm, interesting. Notice they're all pointing in roughly the same direction. What have we already established tonight that that means? Ah, they've been deposited in a flow environment. The brachiopods are also tipped upside down. They're not in a natural position. And uh, there's our fossils there. Um, have a look at that there. Can you see the thorns, the little tiny prickles running along the side? Hey, more fossil thorns, more fossil, fossil spines, more fossil prickles. Interesting what you find when you get out there and dig it up. Now, what's the point of this and what's the connection to outer place fossils? Well, first of all, these rocks formed after Adam sinned, if you take the Bible as real history, as I do, as Standing for Truth does, as George does, uh, as John Mackay does. According to the Bible, these rocks formed after Adam sinned, therefore they are not 450 million years old at all. And you've just put me at odds with people like Erica and people, uh, secular geology, even my own university and my colleagues and people who I've worked with in the past on geological stuff. That puts me at odds with them. And they don't like this idea very much at all. Um, and I admit that. But you have to understand my challenge to the Christians watching this is that challenge that uh, Paul gave the Philippians. Let 
Christ's mind be in you. Try and think things Christ's way. According to the Bible, these rocks formed after Adam sinned. Here's another, <clears throat> excuse me, here's another uh, example of these fossil thorns. And but then both sides. Oh, this isn't uh, one that we collected, by the way. This is actually from up in Canada. Um, this is a Sordonia fossil. Um, Sordonia is Devonian, claimed to be 350 million years old. This is from Quebec in Canada. Same fossils. We've got a positive identification. We went to the world expert on fossil thorns. And he looked at our fossil thorns from Tennessee, from Carthage, from the Ordovician limestone, and he said straight away, hey, yeah, these are Sordonia, tiny little uh, saw. Well, you can see the saw, the little thorns running down the side, nasty little things. Hey, you notice what he just said there? Sordonia Devonian, claimed to be 350 million years old. Interesting. There's the uh, fossil thorns running all the way down them. Here's our standard geological column. We talked a bit about this in the past. We'll probably dive into this in the Q&A session. Um, there's the supposed Devonian. Thorns have been found in the Devonian, recognised by the world's expert in thorns, uh, published in the university there, in the Devonian. Of course, there's the Devonian in Canada, the Sordonia. There's the fossils that we found in Ordovician, Tennessee, the Sordonia as well. Um, hang on a minute, Devonian, Ordovician. We've got ourselves some out-of-place fossils here, namely our fossil thorns in the Ordovician. Because what was our um, professor's reaction? This is a world record, by the way. This is the only example we know. We've collected hundreds of these specimens and we've uh, discussed them. We're now currently writing and publishing some stuff on it. Um, <clears throat> they're definitely land plants. Here's another picture which I collected uh, in that 2020 last year, that visit. You can see definite structure. You can see here we've got a branching. This is not a seaweed. This is a proper branched uh, fossil, carbonized fossil as well. Um, wonderful details. Definitely Sordonia, definitely a form of a lycopod. And by the way, if you believe that these are the Ordovician and you believe that in the secular history of evolution, then these are not supposedly evolved land plants. are not supposed to have evolved for another 40 million million years. Hmm, interesting. We have some out-of-place fossils. Just being land plants, um, they're not supposed to be there for another 40 million years, according to the theory of evolution. What was our professor's reaction? When we took him to them, they said, oh, these are definitely uh, Sordonia. And we said, well, we found them in the Tennessee uh, Carthage deposits, which are Ordovician. He said, that's impossible. Um, there's no way that those are Ordovician rocks in the slightest. And we said, well, here's where we found, here's the record, look, here's the pictures, here's the documentation of us finding them here. Uh, he said, well, there's no way that they could possibly be Ordovician. Uh, the Tennessee Geology Department must have got it wrong. Uh, so we go back to the Tennessee Department of Geology and speak to them there. And of course, they're not happy to change their minds about the, their definition of what's Ordovician or not. They said, no way, it's definitely Ordovician. We're not changing our minds. Um, it's definitely Ordovician, no doubt about it. So we have some out of place fossils. Either you want to argue that land plants evolved 40 million years earlier than they supposedly did, but then nobody's going to go for that because that throws the whole of the theory of evolution into question because you're only supposed to have marine creatures at this point. Or you want to argue that they actually got it wrong. Uh, and that just proves that, well, fossilization has got nothing to do with physical evidence. It's got everything to do with the latest idea, opinion, or theory about it. Uh, and you can find sometimes when these scientists' opinions actually come at odds with themselves. Wonderful in evidence, but the biggest thing is, according to the Bible, both of these, no matter how old you want to argue they are, formed after Adam sinned. Hmm. Interesting. We found thorns in the Devonian. We found thorns in the Ordovician. This fossil, again, loads of these thorns that we found, found in 2006, 2007, 2008 in Canada. Um, again, September 2009, same place. Uh, there's where they're found. There's coal at the top. The fossils were found down the bottom. This is Carboniferous, supposedly 345 to 280 million years old. Not according to the Bible. According to the Bible, these were formed after Adam sinned, therefore that places them under 10,000 years old uh, and most likely between seven to 6,000 years old. Hey, this rock formed after Adam sinned according to the Bible. Carboniferous in Nova Scotia is less than 10,000 years old according to the Bible. Hmm, controversial stuff. We found them in the Carboniferous. Oh, that's Pennsylvania and Mississippian for the um, 
Americans there. Um, Newcastle, Australia, black coal deposits. Uh, me and John there. This is in 2018 when I was doing some research there. We were enjoying a picnic. And look what I found. Oh, you can see over here, this is a large seed fern cone. Ah, uh, yeah, some, uh, most, well, all ferns today don't have seeds. Uh, there were some in the past that did. This is a wonderful seed cone. This is another neuropterous stem. And look what we have, a fossil thorn in Permian coal in Australia. We found them in the Permian. We've also found them in the Cretaceous in the UK. And the point is, according to the Bible, they all formed after Adam sinned. So not only do these thorns question the theory of evolution because they're found all throughout, um, and also bear in mind this idea of flowering plants. Flowering plants supposedly evolved, um, thorns evolved to help uh, stop flowering plants from being eaten. Well, flowering plants weren't supposed to have evolved until the end of the Cretaceous. Yet we're finding thorns all the way down through the fossil record, including ones uh, and land plants and thorny plants where they're aren't even supposed to be any plants in the slightest, land plants at least, uh, until another 40 million years. There's the biblical connection, by the way. Um, Jesus Christ, with a crown of thorns, or a depiction uh, of him wearing the crown of thorns there, which you can find recorded in the Bible. The biblical connection, um, these thorns, the thorns, which were a result of the curse, was the very same curse that it talks about in Revelation being lifted, which was the very curse that Jesus Christ died uh, in order to redeem us from. Ah, have you seen that connection before? Bloodshed, killing, death, thorns, that's what Jesus Christ came to abolish. And he wore a representation of that curse on his head when he died in order to free us from that very curse. Revelation chapter 22, talking about the new heavens and the new earth. And there shall be no more curse. That same curse that was put onto the planet back when Adam uh, chose to disobey God, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. There's the biblical connection. Um, out of place fossils. Do you see how far we can go with this? Not just out of place fossils and in fossils where they shouldn't be, according to the theory of evolution, but the whole of the fossil record, the thorns found all the way through it, according to the Bible, uh, are completely out of place. But then there's that biblical connection at the end there. According to the Bible, thorns are a result of man's sin. And Jesus Christ came to die to save us from our sin, and he wore a representation of that sin on his head when he died in order to free us from the curse. There will be no more bloodshed. There will be no more killing. There will be no more death. There will be no more thorns in the new heavens and the new earth. Make sure that you are actually going to be there um, with me and with George and everyone else who believes in Jesus Christ. A uh, challenge to Christians. And actually a challenge in this case to uh, everybody take off Darwin's glasses and start seeing things God's way. Um, it is a true revelation. And remember our point we made earlier, there are many different hypotheses, theories, opinions that contradict the word of God. The facts just never actually do. Well, that's the end of my uh, slideshow presentation. Apart from a reminder, um, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. Uh, yep, that's the end of my presentation. So that's we've gone through all of that. And that's been getting on for two hours. We've been talking now. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, and come back and say hi to the others. Uh, oops, let's <laughs> escape that. Ooh. There we go. All right, look. Go back online. There we are. We're there. Looks like we are. We are good. I gotta say that was. I gotta say, wow, uh, Joe, that was incredibly informative. <laughs> that was like a full seminar. And yeah, it's 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 let's say it's 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 a lot of information to get in your head, and I know that, and I know it's also a revolutionary concept in some ways. It's so against everything we've been taught in um, in schools and uh, through university and so on and so forth. But um, just a reminder: watch it again. Go to Creation Research. Uh, dot net and find out the research get the questions and answers and also if there are atheists and critics out there who want to criticize then by all means go for it try not to do it on um foolish things like my background or clothes i wear or so on and so forth but if there are some real uh pieces of evidence that you disagree with me about then then challenge me it's good to do that that's 
what science is supposed to be about. Uh, and it's also good to actually challenge and go through stuff. So again, if people want to debate me, um, I'm up for debate. If we can debate about something that is a debatable topic and if we can organize a live thing or whatever, that'd be great. But um, yeah, that's that's my uh, my reminder to people. Amen, Joe. Amen. Yeah. Um, I got to I got to say as as detailed and as informative uh, uh, as that is. And like you said, rewatchable, you know, uh, to everybody in the audience, you know, we still got over 40 people in the chat. So even Wonderful. after two hours, Joe, you, you've kept everybody's attention. Kept people going. And that's great. You, <laughs> you kept keep the people going. And I got to say, I, I personally would not want to be in the position of the critic who has to essentially fight all this data and evidence or, or repent, of course. Um, and in that's, regards that's to the, the best thing, yeah, the repent. Right, that, <laughs> that would be the best. That's thing what we're here do. for. <laughs> and in, in regards to the uh, limestone, which seems so long ago now, um, mm, yeah. your presentation <laughs> most certainly put that argument to bed. I mean, you dealt with it thoroughly. And I, I think that's the most detailed presentation on, on limestone. Uh, yeah, okay. That I've personally ever ever seen. Go ahead, George. Yeah, go ahead, brother. I, I was I was just going to add to the limestone. I, I love these kind of uh, streams because before the stream, I, it sort of um, gets me in the mood to do research. And one of the things I read, Joe, was the Deep Impact mission. Apparently, on the fourth of July, two thousand and five, there was a um, an eight hundred and twenty pound bullet. It was fired into the comet Tempel. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But mm -hmm. what they found, they, they found silicates, which apparently constitute about 95% of the Earth's crust, and they contain considerable oxygen, both which are rare in near vacuums of space and minerals that apparently form in liquid water, such as, wait for it, calcium carbonates. In other words, limestones and clays. Now, yeah. if, if anyone wants to wants to confirm this, there, there's a it was in Science Volume 313, 4th of August 2006, page 637 by Carrie M. Lisi. Okay, it was called the Spitzer Spectral Observations of the Deep Impact Ejector. That's what I'd like to say about uh, the the um, the the, uh, the limestone issue, mm. but uh, on on the uh, out of place um, fossils, uh, I also did some research and found a get a load of this a um, what was it uh, in nine in nine that's right the proceedings of the Paleontological Society nineteen thirty three. It was titled Carboniferous Tracks from Nova Scotia by C.M. Sternberg. It was published by Bulletin of Geological Society of America, volume 44, pages 951, 964. And this is what they said. What about the bird fossil footprints found in the 300 to 360 million year old Carboniferous layer? That's over 200 million years before birds had supposedly evolved. Hello? <laughs> yeah, uh, the other the other part too, Joe, with the with with your erosion rates. I mean, these are sec secular erosion rates have mm. confirmed that the Earth's landscape would erode down to sea level within twelve to forty million years. You work that out over a, a, a four billion year old Earth. How many times did the Earth erode itself down to sea level? And then had to reconstruct itself via uplift. And then you have to ask yourself, why do we still find fossils if this has happened multiple times? It just doesn't work. No. No. And I think yeah, this whole concept of limestone and stuff, um, you can see from some of the, the papers and stuff that we've shown that there are people who are scientists who are genuinely rethinking for limestone formation and so on and so forth, because there needs to be a rethink. Because if you go to modern day limestone deposits, they are nothing like the major geological deposits. So you really shouldn't be using the modern limestone deposits as your framework for producing the geological deposits because they are not the same. 
Um, and uh, that's the what we, we, quite frankly, is the biggest problem with it, um, as well as all the other stuff we've dealt with. But there are people who are reevaluating this. There are people who are rethinking this. Uh, quite a bit of it is stuff that creationists have been saying for a while, but um, what has never really been uh, properly accessed until it's starting to now is the connection of bacteria and so on and so forth with the chemical side of limestone. Now, I'm not saying by any means that I have all the answers, and I expect that there will be many critics who will uh, go through my presentation with a fine-tooth comb and come up with more issues, and that's fine, that's great. Um, my point is, just simply attributing the millions of years is not good enough anymore, uh, because there is so much evidence against that. Now, what I haven't done tonight, and this is something that the critics will probably pick up on, so I'll get ahead of them, what I haven't done tonight is give a full explanation of the exact mechanisms behind limestone formation in the result of Noah's flood. What I've said is that there are people who are reevaluating and thinking this, and we have evidence for it in the terms of the fossils and the strata and so on and so forth. Uh, but what I haven't done is gone through a specific mechanism of it. And that's quite simple why I haven't done that. Um, there isn't one. And uh, there's no, I've got I'm not afraid of, of admitting that. Um, but just simply saying, well, in that case, I'm going to reject it and go with the secular story also is in, quite frankly, a bit of a cop out because there are so many problems with that one as well. What I'm saying is we need an entire reevaluation of the way that limestone forms, one that is connection with uh, flow, lateral flow, one that has connection with quick deposition in flowing water, which the evidence suggests, one that is consistent or could be consistent with a global flood uh, or even best explained by a global flood, and also one that takes into account uh, the um, biological and chemical side of things, which has been ignored by a lot of geology for quite a while. Um, that's what I'm actually saying here, and that's something which I will continue doing research on, on both the creation research and academic level, and something that a lot of other scientists are coming to now as well. Um, but just simply going, well, you haven't got a perfect scenario. Well, nobody's got a perfect scenario. My point is, there are many of these ideas and theories which contradict the word of God, but when you look into the actual evidence, it doesn't, the facts don't, and they actually do seem to support it in many cases, even though we don't have the specific mechanisms behind limestone formation. But the point that we're making, it's a very, in fact, the whole uh, biocarbonate sort of idea is a very new idea anyway, and it's only been touched on by very few scientists. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a radically new idea anyway. Um, so yeah, I say there's a few a few sort of other other comments, but the point that we're making is that there is going to be a way that it is consistent with the Bible, and we're now starting to see the evidence of that. In fact, the standard assumption of chalk and limestone deposition that's promoted by many of the books just simply doesn't work anymore. Awesome, yeah, awesome yeah. response. Actually, George, I just wanted to give a um, a warning real quick because um, I just want to point out that we'll we'll get through as many questions as possible. Um, for myself. I was warned that there'd be um, some work being done around my house when it comes to the, the the internet. So I'm just warning if in the next, let's say, 10, 15 minutes, if if the, the stream crashes, I just wanted to give everybody a warning <laughs> that uh, we didn't do it intentionally. It was kind of, uh, but I think we'll be fine. I just wanted to let everybody know. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I apologize, George. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna, just going to add to what uh, Joseph was saying there. Uh, I, I looked at uh, two, two two particular papers, um, Seling, Selinga, or sorry, Seliga, Carpenter, Lofus, and, and McElroy. Uh, the title of the paper is Mechanisms for the Accumulation of, of High Concentrations of Dinoflagellates in a Bioluminescence Bay. Big, <laughs> that's a big uh, title. Yeah, and so another one, awful, yeah. <laughs> yeah, another one, another one says Toxic Marine Flagellates, their occurrence and physiological effects on animals uh, that's the Jur journal of general microbiology but this is the, uh, the the gist of what i'm trying to say that they found that during bloom periods in the waters near jamaica microorganism numbers have been reported as increasing from 100,000 per liter to 10 million per liter of ocean water now they claim that the reasons for these blooms are poorly understood that f that's fair enough, but suggestions include turbulence of the sea, wind, decaying fish, nutrients from freshwater inflow, and upwelling and temperature. Now, without a doubt, all of these stated conditions would have been 
generated during the catastrophic global upheaval of the flood? I would think so. And hence, rapid production of carbonate skeletons by foraminifera and coccolithopores mm. would be possible. Yeah. So, so we're getting all these hints now, mm. and it's adding to our knowledge of how yeah. we can get quick limestone formation. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the secular science has essentially the same problem that we do in terms of creationists in, in producing that amount of um, carbonate material, whether it comes from a biological origin or a chemical origin. Um, they have that issue. I was actually, it was people uh, write in and ask us about a lot, especially when we published the Hunt Stanton uh, book that we recently did, and you can go and find about that online. We had a few stuff come in, and um, I basically told them, I've, I've got it written down here, there's a, a few explanations for the abundance of these platonic blo blooms, but they're by no means a definitive statement, right? It could be one or the global flood. Uh, there's a couple of options. One, they could have either existed in greater quantities in a pre-flood world, which has evidence, by the way, in the geological record of... Uh, being higher in oxygen, something that mass amounts of coccolithophores would have certainly contributed to. Um, so there's one little piece of evidence, extra evidence there as well. Uh, plus, uh, we also have evidence that it was warmer. There was a higher CO2 level as well. It was warmer in the past and that they were able to exist across the globe rather than being constrained to a small little band around the centre now. Um, because the Bible talks about pre-flood Earth being very warm and it doesn't talk about ice or changes in climate until after Noah's flood. Uh, and in Genesis um, chapter 7, it talks about for the first time, for as long as the Earth shall remain, seed time, harvest, summer, winter, cold and heat shall remain. But that's something we'll talk about uh, in our interview on Saturday. So tune in in there um there could have also been extensive blooms due to the flood itself vast amounts of nutrients would have been available during the year of the flood and even warmer waters due to volcanic activity and um fountains of the great deep bursting up and so on and so forth uh, i suspect that it's a combination of both of these regardless if you want to use modern deposition as an evidence against biblical dates your argument falls down when you try and actually compare the two deposits that's modern deposits and geological deposits as they're nothing alike so there's an extra thought there for you as well and one of the questions they never answer, Joe, is the formation of these, uh, not just the limestone layers, but all, all, all the geological column layers have got uh, smooth horizontal depositions. Mm -hmm. No signs of erosion, soil or vegetation to suggest that they've been yeah. sitting there for millions or tens of thousands to millions of years. You'd yeah. think that that this would be evident in most of the layers if, if that was the case. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the, the very, if you want to get a deposit in the first place, your deposition rate has to be higher than your erosional rate. Yeah. Um, and so when you're dealing with tiny, tiny, tiny deposition things, even like 25 millimetres per thousand years, which is fast if you uh, compare to the rates that you get if you use the physical data attributed to the sedimentation, um, then you're never going to get a deposit in the first place. It's just not going to be deposited. It's going to be eroded away quicker than it's depositing. So. Um, yeah, there's there's numerous there's numerous issues, there's numerous obje objections, uh, and just hiding behind the oh well you are not qualified enough to talk about it doesn't really answer the objections <laughs> anyway. So um, like I say, I'm sure there will be plenty of critics come back after me. That's great, go for it. Uh, you know this is this is one of the things I love. It's debating stuff back and forth. It's discussing stuff. Yes, I have a a, a, a bias. It's this book. It's the Bible. But then so do you. It's one that is based upon uniformitarianism and millions of years, which is based upon a pagan philosophy. So admit that you have a background agenda. I have a background agenda too. Now let's actually get down to the evidence and deal with some of it, right. um, rather than you know hiding behind uh, personal insults or the like. If if yeah. if I could ask a question then, because. Go for it. That's um, going. Yeah, based on everything that you're saying, I've, I've found that the critics or the skeptics, they kind of lack a counter uh, rebuttal when it when it comes to um, the evidence. And obviously, as you're pointing out, ad hominems and personal att mm -hmm. attack. <clears throat> so um, what we see today in, in terms of uniformitarian processes, they can't actually explain the geological features of the earth. Uh, so one argument that, that I've heard them point to over and over again is because they don't have any counter rebuttal to all the evidence suggesting a global worldwide flood, right? Um, they'll say that these catastrophic processes during the flood, the, the fountains of the great deep breaking open, catastrophic plate tectonics, for example, they'll, mm -hmm. see, they'll assert that, that a tremendous amount of heat 
is being produced from these processes that it would preclude a global flood because this heat would boil the oceans essentially, melt mm -hmm. the crust, and kill Noah and the arcs due to the, ra the radiation. I, I know there's a lot of creation scientists working on this, so it's mm -hmm. probably um, a question that could take a couple hour lecture. Yeah. You know, in, of itself. But I'm curious, what what are your <coughs> thoughts on, on that objection that, that they've Okay. Um, the, uh, you are right. There's no one quick answer that I can just spill out and it's definitive right. and, and positive. But then that, that's fine. That's not a problem. Um, there's so many <clears throat> problems from a secular point of view with deposition and so on and so forth anyway, as in you wouldn't physically get what we see around us if it was so, um, that uh, there's going to be objections and issues on the creationist side as well. And the flood, the, the flood heat problem, as it's known, is a real problem. It's a genuine problem. And like you say, there are many creationists working on it. So uh, I'm pretty sure we've got an article, a very in-depth article about it on the Ask site. So go there and have a look. Uh, plus, you can find stuff on Answers in Genesis and so on and so forth. My brief comments, and they will be brief because, like you say, it could be a two-hour lecture. Right. We have been doing some uh, good research into the production of oil and coal. Uh, particularly a, the process behind the production of oil and coal. And we have been producing oil uh, and gas, natural oil and gas, in a, a matter of weeks and natural coal in a matter of days. Right, using specific plants and so on and so forth, putting them in natural environments, uh, controlled environments, but natural environments, and uh, watching them go to work. And what's interesting is a lot of the... Uh, fast production, because um, again, the standard production of oil and coal is a swamp-like environment where you have trees and whatever settle into the ground where they've been living and dying and slowly building up peat, which over time very slowly gets compressed. Now, there's a whole series of issues with that, and we'll get into all of, we could get into all of them, including the fact that the majority of plants found in coal measures do not come from swamp-like environments, but like I say, don't have time to get into that. But <clears throat> If you want to produce coal quickly, if you want to produce oil quickly, there definitely seems to be a specific process which is connected with it. And the process requires heat. So heat, we've done yeah. different tests in different um, backgrounds, in different temperatures, and things with more heat produce coal, oil, and natural gas way, way quicker, uh, sometimes in the order of hours, um, if you add a certain amount of heat to them. Now, all around the Earth, if you interpret the uh, geological record or the vast majority of the geological record, particularly the vast majority of coal, oil and natural gas deposits to a global flood, as I do, as many other creation scientists do, uh, and there's a lot of evidence for that that we've discussed in this program and the last program and John has discussed, and you can go back through our website and SOT and so on and so forth and find out the evidence for it. Um, there are a huge amount of coal and oil deposits. Now, I did a calculation somewhere, and I can't remember the uh, exact details. I'll, I'll, I'll put them up. I can put it up on the comments later, which was calculating the based on modern day production of plants and so on and so forth, basing that in a flood and then making the point that uh, before the flood, there would have been plenty enough of organic material in plants and animals to produce this amount of coal and oil and so on and so forth. Um, and that's a fascinating study in itself, but I don't want to misquote my, my research, so I'll put it up separately. But the point was there's plenty of uh, material to produce coal and oil. However, you still need a mechanism to produce it in the space of a flood. Well, if our research is correct, and I say we're still in the early stages of it at the moment, but if our research is correct, then there is a d definitive connection between heat and coal and oil production. Now, in a global flood scenario, lots of tectonic activity, lots of things, lots and lots of heat, hence the flood heat problem. However, what you do have is the perfect environment to actually absorb an incredible amount of that heat in the form of a chemical and physical uh, process which is connected to producing coal and oil. Uh, so I'm not saying that that is the answer. I'm saying that we think that that could be an answer and we will certainly continue investigating it because uh, of the connections with coal and oil and rapid formation and so on and so forth and that's a fascinating study as it is but if we are proven to be right or certainly find evidence for that you may well have a good piece of evidence explaining the flood heat problem as in you've created an enormous battery if you like which sucks up the vast majority of the heat uh, or certainly enough heat to avoid the heat problem uh, in the form of coal and oil production and that would also explain how we could get 
get the huge amounts of coal and oil produced in the space of a one year or soon after that one year flat. Um, so there's a few thoughts. Like I say, the critics will probably tear it to shreds and that's fine. We're in the early stages of this, but there are certainly enough issues with the secular interpretation of the geological history on the earth that um, it's uh, we're valid a, a, a few objections ourselves or issues ourselves. But I think the more we do research into this, the more we will actually see there's a perfect explanation for it. And me personally, I highly suspect it has something to do with the formation of coal oil and the basically the carbonization process or the change into carbonites. So they're my thoughts. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, actually, George, I got a couple of thoughts on my mind if I can get them out right, real quick okay. uh, before I lose them. But uh, that's a great answer, phenomenal answer. And um, exactly, no model's perfect. And mm. as you're pointing out, um, heat and energy would then be features of the flood and not necessarily... Yeah obviously not necessarily a bug like the critics want to say. I've also heard that um, particular lines of evidence, and I know George can speak to this as well, um, that seem to indicate um, accelerated nuclear decay has occurred mm -hmm. in the past, like mm -hmm. radio halos and fishing tracks come yeah. to mind. Yeah. I've That's heard that they would- A whole different, yeah. Topic, right. Yeah. And, and I've heard that those lines of evidence, those scars in the rocks themselves would not actually exist if there was as much heat as the critics suggest, because the, mm. the, the excess heat would have obliterated those mm. lines of evidence. So I've heard yeah. that too, which means, you know, rapid cooling or these types of mechanisms that, that you're talking about that could mitigate the heat are, are plausible. So and I apologize, uh, George. I was just say, please go and go. You go ahead, George. Uh, I was just going to bring in two other points uh, with regards to the heat. Uh, I mean, so science has shown that uh, there's a substance called ringwoodite, and apparently, uh, from uh, I guess they've uh, calculated it in some way. They've determined that one and a half to two and a half percent of the ringwoodite uh, would contain water, and they estimate something like three times as much water is contained in ringwoodite as uh, exists in the oceans today. So that's another area where you could get uh, heat absorption because of the specific heat absorption of water. But also, we did we did a stream some time ago, Joe, with uh, Steph Harina. Uh, he's done quite a bit of work on uh, salt domes and the magmatic nature of salt domes. Effectively, mm -hmm. it's molten salt. And when you look at it and you look at the geometry of the or the shape of the salt domes you, you you have to ask yourself how could that molten salt go through those hot oh sorry those hard rock layers and form in that shape there's only one way that could happen those layers had to be moist otherwise hmm. you would never get that shape forming yeah yeah and i think honestly um I mean, I say there's not a, 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 a one quick answer to the flood heat problem. And I honestly, I don't think there ever will be. I think it will be a, uh, a mixture of different things. Um, like you mentioned, the radio halos and so on and so forth and the salts and on our part with the coal and stuff. I think it's going to be a mixture of different things. Um, and that's because we have different scientists working on them. I mean, my background, like I say, is paleontology or paleobiology specifically earth science looking into sedimentation and uh, recreating paleo environments and animals and so on and so forth like that right uh, that's my not only my academic background it's also my main interest right so i'm going to be looking more into that so when i'm doing investigations and when we're doing coal and oil and so on and so forth that's where we're mostly looking at whereas the guy who sort of the people who spearhead radio halos like snelling or so on and so forth they are not as much uh, sedimentary geologists as they are geophysicists. I mean, Andrew Snelling's yeah. PhD was in geophysics, right? And in uh, radiocarbon stuff and radioactive stuff and radio halo. So he's going to be looking a lot more into that and Larry Vardman and the whole sort of um, rate people as well, you know. And so different geologists are going to be coming at it from uh, different points of view based on their own knowledge and based on their own interests as well. So I think that ultimately, I mean, science is not a, uh, whether you are a secular scientist or whether you're a creation scientist, scientist is not a one answer job. You know, there's often many, many different facets that actually get brought into an answer or something because you are reconstructing a history of the past. And there are going to be mistakes when you do that. There are going to be issues when you do that. The question is, what do you take as your authority? Do you take a pagan idea at its roots, which has become philosophized into a point which has been primarily to reject scripture and be anti-religious?
religion uh, as your starting point, which is birthed uh, the foundations of what is considered now geology and dating methods and so on and so forth, or do you take the Bible? I mean, both of them come from religious standpoints, there's no doubt about that. Um, but to claim that it's purely objective is simply false. So there's going to be lots of issues, there's going to be lots of contradictions and stuff as you go through and issues and debates, and that's great, let's go for it. Um, but I would say, it's not going to be, I don't think it's ever going to be a one quick answer, you know, oh, here's the answer to that kind of thing. Um, but I think I think there's going to be a multifaceted uh, answer to it, and uh, I'm pretty convinced that there's going to be something to do with, uh, uh, so if, it, if it's not coal or oil, although I'm pretty sure that it will be, there'll be something which can absorb large amounts of heat very, very, very quickly. Um, and that energy is transferred. The heat energy is being transferred into a chemical and physical process, which basically is carbonization. It turns one form of carbon into another form of carbon. That's it at a very, very simple level. Um, if I could jump in there real quick, I think that's a great answer, great response. And um, I, I definitely want to get... At, to this question at least, and it kind of pertains yeah. to paleontology and it's in a way a response to the portion of our last discussion where we focused on human evolution and some mm -hmm. of the transitional forms. So, um, and, and to be honest with you, this is probably another question that could take its own full presentation, but um, we'll kind of just deal with it the way we can. Um, but proponents of human evolution Mm -hmm. They frequently point to two specific so-called transitional forms. One of them is uh, Homo habilis, and the other one is Australopithecus sediba. They'll say mm -hmm. that these are their two best examples of so-called transitional forms, to them demonstrating, you know, ape to human evolution. So I'm just curious um, as, as to what um, your thoughts are on, on, on the, that claim specifically about sure. those two examples. Okay, um, if you go to uh, askjohnmackay.com and you um, click on the, the Q&A site, so there's a whole thing on human evolution and we deal with Homo habilis specifically and I'm pretty sure um, we deal with the uh, Australopithecines as well there. Uh, we deal with something with them, whether it's not the specific one, but certainly Homo habilis and also uh, the recent stuff, there was the Hobbit and stuff that was, was passed around. So that will go into a lot more detail also for people who are more qualified than me. We have medical biologists and uh, paleoanthropologists and so on and so forth on there who, who deal with that. So that's the first thing. If you want the real full comprehensive answer, go there. On very simple terms, because like I say, this isn't my main area of expertise, but on very simple terms, one thing that we have always discussed about the so-called transitional forms is that they are either 100% provably ape or 100% provably human. There are so many distinct differences, and that's something which you mentioned last time, um, people who promote the theory of evolution and so on and so forth, they are constantly looking at the similarities between um, humans and apes, right? And there are some similarities. There's no denying that. There's some similarities between us and frogs. There's similarities between us and a banana, um, so on and so forth, right? There are going to be similarities in both physical stuff and in DNA and so on and so forth. One thing that it's very rarely looked at are the differences, because there are very major differences from um, very major distinctions between apes and humans, from the pelvis to the jawbone to the skeletal structure to the DNA to the way that it moves and works and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, I have not yet been shown any evidence or any uh, even evolutionary secular claim of finding a specific organism which has got traits of both. Um, they're either completely ape, albeit a large ape, albeit maybe a separate type of ape to what we're used to today, orangutans, chimpanzees, so on and so forth. Um, but they are still definitely ape. Likewise with the human beings, okay, they may be a smaller human being, they may have a smaller brain, they may have a bigger brain than us, they may be bigger and stockier, they may be smaller than us, they may have bone disease, so they're bent over and so on and so forth, but they are definitely and characteristically human beings. So that's sort of the argument in a nutshell, but like I say, I don't want to go on and say something that's not right or so on and so forth. Uh, I haven't studied it as much as I have other stuff because you can't study everything. So go to creationresearch.net, click on the Q&A or it's askjohnmackay.com and you'll find a whole load of details in there as well. Awesome. I, I appreciate that, Joe. And uh, George, I, I know you saved a couple questions as well from the audience. So if you wanted to uh, pick one or two out of that, that massive compilation we have, and we'll try and get to a couple of those before we shut it down. So go ahead, yeah. George. Yeah, this is from uh, Pete Said. Um, mm -hmm. He asks, the limestone in Cheddar Gorge and Avon Gorge, Bristol, typically yep. have diagonal bedding 
in this form is this from uplift or cross bedding during the flood thanks sure um okay <clears throat> yeah i've visited both those places and spent many many happy hours uh, uh wandering around there collecting fossils and doing uh, some geological research there um my uh opinion would be most likely it is cross bedding uh, that goes back to our whole concept. I think we touched on it last time, which was where did the whole idea of stratification or stratigraphication or, you know, basically superposition come from uh, versus what we see in the real world. And I spoke to you about Nicholas Stino, who uh, basically proposed the idea of superposition. That's the layers on the bottom, then on the top and so on and so forth. And they build themselves upwards. Uh, and that's a wonderful scenario, but we don't observe that anywhere in the world because in order to get that you would need to have sediment which is pre-suspended and the only way you can get sediment become eroded and transported into a place to settle is by flowing water water that's moving sideways and one thing we've uh, discovered from both um, Guy Barteau who was a um, 1800s um, scientist sedimentologist who was studying Venice and the way that Venice moves uh, very unpopular but very practical guy um, showed that sediments form sideways this is something that we observe in the real world it's something that a lot of the sedimentologists are now cottoning onto as well uh, which is sediments being transported by flowing water and deposited sideways. So you can go back to creationresearch.net, click on the experiments, wonderful pictures on there. Go to creationresearch.live. There is a new video up about Jurassic Arc, which has these videos in action and has these strata flumes in action. Some of our experiments, which are not our own experiments per se, they are actually based off of um, research scientists and soil scientists. We've got even got a research scientist uh, in the USA working with us who looks at this concept of sideways deposition that's a concept we've uh, that's a term that we've come up with because it basically produces it very nicely but it's basically lateral flow deposition right um and it's a, it's a fascinating study but what it does is in our research and in a lot of people's research who deal with this stuff uh you find that it actually sideways flowing water uh current led flowing water lateral flow water carrying sediment whether it's a sandstone or a slurry and depositing it actually produces one wonderful cross bedding all the way through it uh, and you can tell whether it's cross bedding rather than uplift quite easily because inside each of the sediments so you've got your main boundary layer here there it's all going to be going like this which is your cross bedding as opposed to uplift which we can see where you have straight rows of sediment which has become bent upwards right so there's a clear distinction between the two uh, and in both the Avon case and in the um, Cheddar Gorge case they are regarded as cross bedding and that's the same for I mean that that's regarded even in secular uh, journals as well it's regarded as cross bedding so this whole claim that limestone uh, can't form under flowing water is nonsense as well because not only have we shown you from the scientific literature we've also actually you can go through the scientific the the, the secular scientific stuff talking about the specific geology of the area uh, the UK is the most documented um has the most documented geological record in the world we've been doing it for the longest we've had the most scientists working on it it's absolutely fantastic over the last two to three hundred years of geological research here uh, the amount of books and maps and stuff that we've had so you can go back through the literature and find this is definitely cross bedding it's regarded as cross bedding and cross bedding requires something actually pushing the materials pushing the sediment along in the case of a marine deposit it's going to be water um so they yeah it, it's 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 definitely cross bedding um as opposed to as opposed to uplift in both of those two cases one of the uh... I watched uh, an interesting video a couple of days ago on seismites. Uh, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurt, Kurt Wise showed a demonstration where, and he actually was at, he was actually at the Appalachian Mountains where he actually showed um, a seismite, I think it was six foot high. And um, he showed that this, this could only have been caused by a massive, massive earthquake. Mm -hmm. Um do you know anything about seismites at all? Not off the top of my head, no. Um, I've heard of the term before. Um, I'm not sure where I've heard the term before, but uh, leave it with me and I'll go away and have a, have a little bit it's, of a look and research, and I expect you will as well. It's but no, I can't, I can't comment on that at the moment. It's, it's literally as, as the layer shakes, you get a spurt of water coming to the surface. Hmm, okay. And... Um, you can imagine something that might be like 10 mil high, but this is like six feet, like almost mm. two meters high. 
And uh, the only way that could have happened is through a massive, massive earthquake. All right, look, I've got, a, I've, got another, I've got another question here from Jamie Russell. Uh, I think it was to do with your his, historical uh, uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. he, say, he says, do you think as the false history was passed along from empire to empire, they were wanting to assert the deepest ancestry, what drove the trend? Oh, that's definitely the case in uh, in in situations like um, Hindu and so on and so forth. The whole philosophy is based on reincarnation or regeneration, if you like, uh, where it's a e infinite world, you know, infinite universe. And so, even the god Brahma, who is the cosmos, who has over three trillion years uh, or lifespan, um, he himself reincarnates into a new Brahma uh, as it goes on. And so, there's never been uh, not a Brahma, and so. On and so forth so um they would claim the greatest ancestry of all if you like but yeah it certainly seems to have gone on because you can see a progression from the sumerians which is based loosely on the bible to the assyrians and the babylonians and so on and so forth and um certainly when the this was in the days remember when uh, and this was what was so revolutionary about the romans because they didn't do this in those days you would invade a land and you would relocate the people from the land you would take them and put them in a different land and you'd put different people in the land you've just invaded which is to really to stamp your authority and stamp your power over the people you know you can't worship who you used to worship you can't uh, be where you used to be you take you from your homes it's a very invasive it really is an invasion right and uh, the assyrians and the babylonians and the samaritans all that culture really did that the romans didn't the romans were the first real sort of invaders to say oh you can stay here and worship and so on and so forth and we'll look after you provided you pay your taxes right and so uh, you can see the progression from the Sumerians to the Assyrians to the Babylonians. Every time they invaded and took it on, they established themselves as the authority in that area, which included racial superiority. Now, racial superiority is always been based on the longest established or the oldest, if you like. You know, we've been around here the longest. We've had the most time to establish ourselves and or evolve, right? Even through evolutionary racism history, and that's a fascinating study in itself, one that we don't have time to get into tonight. It's all been based on who has the first, if you like, um, evolutionary ancestor and, you know, that whole sort of thing. So there would definitely have been a case of, oh, we've got to be better than the Assyrians and the Sumerians because we've been here longer than them so we're going to adopt their pagan philosophy but we're going to change it as Barossus did um, to uh, a huge you know millions of years and so on and so forth so there's definitely a case of that there's also a case of the Bible's got an interesting Bible verse and I can't remember exactly where it is now but it talks about uh, sin being passed on through the generations uh, and if a ancestor makes a mistake or an ancestor makes a sinful choice that is going to be passed on down through the generations and adopted down through, the, uh, down through the generations and you see this all over the world you see it with the Australian Aborigines you see it with the Africans you see it in the uh, uh, sort of Asian and the European cultures as well where their ancestors made a clear and deliberate rejection of authority of God and as a result everybody they influence down onwards is also going to adopt that anti-biblical agenda uh, whether they like it or not kind of thing but often they like it um, and so you also have that to contend with as well once you make a deliberate step away from the truth of the bible you are actually going to end up influencing your descendants and influencing the people you invade and so on and so forth and so it gets passed on down that way as well ultimately it all comes back to a humankind's sinful nature as the bible talks about it um we are willingly, willfully ignorant. We are willfully anti-authority. We are willfully anti-biblical by our own nature. Um, that's why we're sinners. That's why we need a savior. Uh, and because of that, we are always looking to excuse our behavior and or to excuse our atheism. And that's ultimately what evolution is at the end of the day. It's an excuse for atheism. Um, it's an excuse to try and explain away the need to not uh, the need to believe in a God and explain away uh, why you don't believe in a God. At the end of the day, that's where it came from. That's where it stemmed from. That's where the whole historical presentation this evening has really tried to show. So you'll find that pagan cultures down throughout the ages, whenever they reject the word of God, they always seem to resort back to this issue of the age 
of the earth and a naturalistic um, origin for life, whether you're dealing with the Sumerians or the Babylonians, all the way down through to the French philosopher, philosophers and revolutionaries to Erasmus Darwin, to Charles Lyell, to Charles Darwin, and down to the present day. So, and you, and you see a demonstration of that today with all the different legislation that's appearing around the world, uh, be it uh, homosexuality, uh, gender, abortion, etc., etc. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I uh, say, so, you know, this is, I mean, you know, so we could be here for hours and hours. That's a whole different, you know, the political side of things. But um, yeah, I mean, for people who want to find out more, and for the critics as well, I so say you can go and you can find out there's loads of stuff on our website. You can, the, the new streaming site is really good as well, um, where you can pay a relatively small amount to stream one of our videos. Uh, we used to be uh, to pay a, a large amount to get a DVD or download an MP4, or whatever, but you can stream now. It's accessible. It's really good. So you find all of these topics on there. Uh, creationresearchlive.com and I say I've been looking through the but since I did my last interview I've been looking through the Standing for Truth channel there's some really great stuff on there some really great speakers as well and people who I've admired for a long time before I even came into this sort of um, uh, ministry so yeah keep searching the truth and you know keep keep uh, yeah keep at it well I really appreciate that actually Jordan if I could jump in real quick yeah. because um, I'm going to point out we're going on two hours and 40 minutes and uh, yeah. Indiana Joe, he's been talking nonstop. Uh, Joe, it's, it's 10 to midnight here now. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do, same thing as always, we're going to, we're going to save any questions that we have. I got to say, even though we're coming up on three hours, time has really flown by. You are such a blessing, uh, Joe, so much good information. Uh, great answers to the questions that we got to some of them, you know, tough questions that that could require entire presentations of, on their own. So definitely I want people to check out your website and uh, check out the YouTube channel as well. So I really appreciate the time you've given to us. I think we're going to wind it down here with some final thoughts, yeah. final words. Sounds good. Uh, George. I, uh, I, know I interrupted uh, you there. I, I apologize, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's all right. I can't. I can't let this go by not telling a a short joke. Uh, <laughs> jo, 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 Joseph, why did the limestone get arrested? Oh, go on. I think I like this joke. I like the like geological <laughs> jokes. Go on. Tell yeah. me, why did the limestone get arrested? For basalt and battery. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, now now that we've hit rock bottom, I'll <laughs> hand it over to Standing. Awesome. Hey, listen, now we can end it with a bang, with a good laugh. Laughter is the best medicine. Yes. Uh, so this was a, an awesome stream. Right. Awesome presentation, Joe. Once again, I can't thank you enough for giving us your time and close to three hours, which essentially has flown by. Thank you to the audience. We've maintained a, a solid audience. Yeah, we've still got time. 37 watching now. I'm just saying that's a great, a great thing. Yeah, so wonderful. We could probably keep this going for another 10 hours, but Amen, we need yeah. to eat some food. <laughs> My throat needs to get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and George, you need to get some breakfast in. So I'm going to hand it over to our awesome guest, Indiana Joe. Once again, thanks so much. Uh, such a great stream, and I, I want people to share it. I want this information right. to get out to as many people as possible. So, Joe, some final Thanks. words uh, before we shut it down for the night. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, it's been it's been a wonderful pleasure, and hopefully that's cleared some stuff up for some people. And if it hasn't, then you know, come back with more criticism. Criticism is great. Uh, it's 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 ad homs and false stuff. It just, just don't do that. There's no need for that. It's unprofessional anyway. Come back with real criticisms and discussions, and we'll take it further. That's great. I'd love to come back again um, and do more remember creationresearch.net remember creationresearch.live remember to tune in to creation researchers facebook and youtube channel uh, on saturday at about seven o'clock in the evening for uk time so tune in there'll be me and john talking about our new documentary and uh, fire and ice and climate that promises to be very fascinating and uh, yeah if there are any atheists or critics out there who would <clears throat> like to debate me over a uh, a geological topic you know long ages or young earth or so on and so forth like that i'm i'm up for it if we can agree on a good topic to debate over so um yeah get in touch and i'm sure standing for truth would uh, would would uh, look to do something like that soon so god bless everybody it's been absolutely fantastic joe joe before you go what did the limestone say to the geologist <laughs> go on then george <laughs> don't take me for granite <laughs> that would work for a lot of other a lot of other rock formations as well <laughs> you could be here for oh, a while you, you, you've been fantastic joe uh, god bless you good to see you again we'll see you later yes god bless, god bless all all as well
some great final words, Joe. And I, I would love to see a, a, a critic step up and, and maybe we can set up a debate because be uh, you are a walking encyclopedia. I, I would not want to be a critic or an evolutionist uh, having to face you. So I appreciate your final words, uh, George. I appreciate the final joke. We can end it on, on a good note here, on a good laugh. And, and say, hello, say hello to my mate, John McKay. I will do. I'll be speaking to him tomorrow. So, um, yeah, we will okay. go. <clears throat> okay, guys. God bless everybody. God bless, God bless. the chat. God bless uh, George and Joe. SFT is 